So let's start. So next speaker, Martin Sapotic, who is currently at the Institute of Physiology of the Czech Academy of Science, and you have been there since 2008, I read here in my notes. Before that, you were at the Max Planck in Dresden and at the Rockefeller University in New York and also a postdoc University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. So research areas, computational neuroscience, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, and uh, axon growth and neural development. So please, welcome. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation to this excellent meeting. Uh, today, I will tell you about uh, neural development. As was already mentioned, um, I work in the uh, Institute of Physiology in Prague, where we have a uh, small department of computational neuroscience, where we are physicists and mathematicians working on uh, analysis and modeling uh, of uh, neural systems. And the reason why I'm, I why I'm listing uh, the Max Planck Institute in Dresden here is that uh, I am there right now for a half year sabbatical and um, I'm uh, extending there uh, some, some of the work that I will be showing you today. Okay, here's the outline. Uh, I will speak about modeling of specific biological systems, so I will need to give you a fair amount of biological introduction. Uh, I will first uh, tell some basics about axon growth and uh, axon bundling. Then uh, the second part of the talk will be the main part. Um, I will speak about uh, axon zippering, you will see what it is, uh, and resulting network formation. Uh, and that will be uh, work that was done in tight uh, collaboration with, uh, uh, with neurobiologists. So I will show you both the experiment and uh, theoretical analysis and modeling all coupled together in this part. And in the, in the last part of the talk, um, uh, I will come back to some older work uh, that we did about uh, eight no, to ten years ago. And that will actually be more theoretical than the second part. It's not so well coupled to experiments. But uh, in the end I decided to, to show it a bit briefly because it relates to some models uh, of uh, uh, aggregation uh, that were you know, uh, mentioned here in several talks uh, already. So I thought it would be nice to make a connection. By, by the way, uh, Stefan, uh, now we go back to the one hour plus 15 minute scheme, right, for the talks. That's at least what Jürgen confirmed to me yesterday <laughs> evening when I was wondering about it. Okay. Um, so, mm -hmm. the pointer works, but Okay, so uh, this is just, uh, you know, I think you all know uh, the structure, the typical structure of a bipolar neuron. Uh, it has uh, dendrites, a dendritic tree, uh, and uh, it has only one axon, okay? And uh, the axon typically branches in the terminal region so that it can form a number of synapses. Um, and then, uh, uh, in a typical area of the brain, uh, you get this enormous mess out of uh, axons and dendrites. In fact, in a millimeter cube of uh, mammalian brain cortex, uh, there are typically several kilometers of axons okay, in one millimeter cube. Um, Vincent Hakim, uh, in his talk on Tuesday morning, discussed uh, synapses, uh, the dynamics of the structure of synapses. I will be actually at the earlier stage before the synapses get formed. Okay? So I will cover today growth of axons. So, uh, what I will show is also relevant to some types of dendrites and in general to neurites, which are dendrites and axons or yet undifferentiated processes growing out of neurons that's technically called neurites. Uh, but I will concentrate today on, on the axons. So, uh, axon growth. Uh, so, the previous picture was 
you know, uh, when it forms synapses, it, the axon branched and connected to terminals. But before then, it has to grow. And the growth is led by this structure called the growth cone at the tip, uh, which typically advances uh, with a rate of a few dozen micrometers per hour. And the axon ex is extended behind it. Okay? And the growth cone is a, uh, is a smart structure that can react to external signals uh, and uh, therefore navigate to the right location. Um, so I want to immediately distinguish two uh, path, two ways of navigating. One is uh, when each growth cone is independently feeling the external environment and is guided somewhere. And the second possibility is when you have multiple axons growing of the same type or of different types. And while they are growing, they interact with each other in some way. Okay? So then the axon navigation and targeting becomes a collective phenomenon. And this is what I will be speaking about today. Um, so I will not be speaking about the guidance of the growth cone, of an individual growth cone, by external gradients of chemical guidance cues. I know that some of you have worked on that. That will be absent from my talk today. So uh, the external growth cone, a bit in detail, uh, here is, uh, you know, here is a uh, the growth cone that's leading an axon uh, growing from a neuron in culture. Uh, here is uh, the structure of the growth cone. And this is actually a super resolution uh, a microscopy picture where you can see uh, the, the F actin and uh, the tubulin uh, fluorescently marked. And then there are some decorations which are uh, the, the, the myosin motors. Okay, it's just added by hand. And uh, uh, this, uh, the cytoskeleton generates forces. Okay. Um, the polymerization at the tip and also uh, contractility due to myosin activity, setting up a uh, retrograde actin flow, which when it couples to the substrate, okay, uh, then uh, leads to attraction force and uh, the advancement uh, of the growth cone. Uh, now, here's actually a picture from uh, people who measured the traction force, which the growth cone will exert on the substrate. And uh, uh, this is the, you know, the intensity of, of the local traction force. And this vector gives you the integrated traction force. Okay? So what you can see that in the end, the growth cone pulls on this action shaft okay, behind the growth cone. And what it immediately sets up is a tension, mechanical tension, okay, in the axon shaft behind growth cone. And the tension is actually crucial for neural growth, and it will be crucial for the main part of my story today. Uh, so uh, axons tend to have some preferred value of tension and maintain it okay, during their functioning. And in fact, uh, the tension is not completely dependent on the growth cone. Here, uh, I'm showing some uh, uh, experiments where they worked with axons that are already connected to a neuromuscular junction. Okay, So the growth cone is already absent. It's already, there's already terminus. And, and here they actually, this is in vivo really, where they now moved the muscle with the neuromuscular junction with the terminal of the axons. So they made the axon slack okay, and waited. And then within several minutes, the axon uh, became taut again. Okay, the tension in the axon recovered. Okay, to to this preferred value, and if they do the same experiment uh, uh, with ATP depleted, uh, this recovery uh, of tension does not happen. So it shows that uh, it's actually an active active process. So uh, even within the axon shaft, okay, you can generate axon tension, and only quite recently, actually, the ultrastructure of the axon shaft was, was shown to be uh, you know, quite, quite interesting, but it's not quite clear how it actually generates, generates the tension. So uh, now the first person who actually started really analyzing tension in, in growing axons was, was Dennis Bray in Cambridge. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he looked at force balance in branching axons. Okay? So here, uh, the, the axon, uh, when it grows, uh, the growth cone can bifurcate, okay? and then you will get two branches, each led by its own growth cone. Okay? And the question is, what determines this ang the angles at the junction, okay, at the branch? Uh, so basically, Bray, Bray showed that 
uh, it's determined, at least in the system he was working with, by uh, the balance of the tension forces. Okay? If you want to have a static structure, then the three tensions, tension vectors must, must add to zero. And this is actually a scheme from an experiment that was done in vivo, where they did a cut of one of the branch and then, as expected, uh, this adjusted then to a different angle because this tension vector is now missing. Okay? There is, but in this case, it's not a strong. It's, a, it's not a fixed tension. It's some, just some friction. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, Dennis Bray was doing uh, uh, in 1970s, 80s things like this when, when you now have a branched axon, and you can, if you believe in this force balance, then you can invert it, and from measuring the geometry, the angles, you can start inferring the tensions in the branched axon. Okay? So, for example, here you would say this tension T0, I set it to 1, uh, I call it 1. Then I measure these angles, and therefore I can calculate this tension T1 and T2. And then I continue like that okay, through all the junctions. Okay? Uh, and I can, I can deduce what are the tensions, and then uh, you can do, like, like these people did in, in a later paper, you can plot uh, these values of the tensions that you deduced versus the thickness of the axon that you observe in the microscope, and you see there is a quite nice linear relationship. Okay? So it shows that a tension in the axons typically scales with the, with the diameter, not the area. Yes? Yeah. kind of perturbation, yes. then uh, sometimes you have a response as different yeah, yeah. So, so this was not doing perturbations, okay? This was just something that was grown and happy, okay? Uh, I agree completely with you that, that if you induce transients, yeah. you have to be more careful. Be I completely case. agree with you, yes. Out of curiosity, how does branching occur? Is it the splitting of the ends, or is it a branch that uh, grows from the side of an already? Uh, so axon? there are two mechanisms. One is the growth cone bifurcates, okay, and you said much it. And another one, less frequent, is that the growth cone is here, a shaft is here, and the new shafts start growing like this. Both are possible. Okay, and and here actually is a is a nice experiment that shows that tension value can control retraction of axon branches. This is a branched axon. Here it connected to some post. It grabbed to it, increased tension. It became more straight. And all the side branches, which are not linked to something, retract. Okay? So, so tension controls uh, quite a few things. <coughs> and because I know some, some of you have worked on synapses and even vesicles in a synapses, okay? I want to just flash this slide where uh, um, in 2009 these people showed that uh, the tension in the axon shaft uh, controls uh, uh, synaptic vesicle clustering. This was again shown at the neuromuscular junction where uh, they, they followed vesicle clustering by tagging uh, synaptotagmin and they saw several fold differences depending on whether uh, they pulled and the axon therefore inducing ten more tension or not. Okay. okay, so that was you know growth of individual axons and uh, mechanical tension in the axon shaft. And now the second biological component of my story is axon bundling. Okay? So what it means is, uh, this is a classical paper where they uh, followed the very early development of a limb in a grasshopper embryo. And so at the first stages you see these axons, so the, the dots are, uh, so uh, actually, the, these are the cell bodies, and then you have the growing axons out of it, okay? And uh, the first axons have to somehow find their way on their own, okay? They are the so-called pioneer axons. They have to react to some external guidance cues. But then the later axons uh, can join the already grown previous ones, okay? And start forming fascicles and be guided to the right location if they manage to bundle with the right pioneer axon. Okay, and they no, need, no longer need to be as good to, as following the, the external guidance cues. Uh, this is an image from the retina where there's massive bundling of uh, axons of the retinal output cells, and if you knock out a particular type of cell adhesion molecule, you you lose this bundling. Okay, showing that it's it's mediated by, by axon-axon adhesion. 
but also defasciculation is very necessary. If you form a bundle of axons and it reaches the target location, you don't want all of them to form synapses in one place. You want them to defasciculate and cover an area. Okay, so the control of fasciculation and defasciculation, which are the same as bundling and debundling, is, is biologically very important. So, uh, and what, what we were interested in were, were the mechanisms of axon fasciculation or axon bundling. And this is actually a, a picture from a, from a review paper uh, which sort of shows the prevailing view of in the biological literature of how fasciculation happens. Growth, the growth cone attaches to another axon and follows it, right? So for a biologist, basically the growth cone encounters another axon and it somehow then makes a decision, I like it or I don't like it, okay? And if yes, I will latch on it and I will follow and therefore the axon shaft behind the second growth cone is linked to the axon on which it's growing, okay? That's, that's really the very prevalent biological view. Uh, so in this scheme you have, this is like the, the, the first axon that's following some guidance Q and this is the second one and, and of course it has to adhere to the first one, okay? So uh, the cell lesion molecules are important. Um, and uh, what we bring in, okay, is that uh, this does not, it, this is not fully controlled by the growth cone. Uh, in fact, the axon shafts can make, okay, some also decisions on whether axons will bundle together or not. And that can be controlled by uh, balance or imbalance of mechanical tension in the axons and uh, the adhesion between the axons. Okay, so that's the, the, like the key uh, message of the, of the story. All right, uh, so. Sorry, can you explain just a little bit about this mechanism of attachment? Mm -hmm. So there are some kind of adhesion uh, uh, molecules that at the tip of uh, the growth cone will attach to the axon, or there is a sensing. I mean, it occurs spontaneously. Can you elaborate to explain a little bit about this? So part? yeah, so so the growth cone is is definitely able to sense, okay, uh, the environment, including when it hits another axon. There will be some signal transaction process, okay, that can influence then, uh, for example, uh, the formation of uh, adhesion junctions, okay, uh, and. Um, but now it depends on, on, on the type of axons. There are some types of axons that by default will not stick to each other, okay? If you bring them artificially into contact, the axon shafts, they will not, not adhere. But there are other types of axons which on the contrary adhere very strongly, okay? So what I will, when I will speak about adhesion, I will speak about a very, very simplistic adhesion, okay? Saying I have the type of axons that on the axon shafts express mutually compatible cell adhesion molecules, okay? And when they get in proximity, they will start forming adhesion bonds. <laughs> and I will not involve any signaling before that, okay? Okay, so now I'm starting to show the, the you know, experiments from, from, from our work. Uh, the experiments were, were done by collaborators in, in Paris, uh, uh, mainly in the lab of uh, Alain Tambleau, who's at, uh, at uh, UPMC in Paris. Uh, and mo most of the results I will, that I will show you are uh, you know, published in a very long paper in eLife last year. Uh, and um, now, uh, this is uh, actually axon fasciculation in explants of olfactory epithelia from embryonic mice, okay? Now, in this main part of the talk, it will not be important that it's axons of olfactory sensory neurons, okay? But just, you know, so you're oriented, these are the axons that normally grow from the nose to the olfactory bulb in the brain, okay? And in, these, in this olfactory nerve, they form very tight fascicles, okay? So here's a cross-section of the fascicle from electron microscopy, yeah? So, so it's actually functionally important, the fasciculation of these axons when it's in vivo, okay? But we will, I will show you data from, from culture with explants. Uh, so um, this is actually the, the typical structure 
of the network of exons that grows out of the explant. This is an actual microscopic picture, so the explant is destroyed in the procedure, but you know, you, the, the, this is the, the network is preserved, so you see nicely the structure. And I want to immediately stress, these are actually unbranched exons in culture. Okay? In vivo, they will branch once they get to the olfactory bulb, but in culture, they are unbranched. Okay? Yet, they form a network. Okay? How can they do it? They do it by mutually adhering to each other. Okay, and forming fascicles. So this is, you know, the, the culture, the explants from embryonic mice put on a uh, laminin coated substrate, incubated for two days, and then uh, this network of axons grows out. Okay, and there are at the, at the, in the first two days, uh, the, just, just the growth cones advance and the whole thing grows. Then there is an intermediate stage where the growth cones are no longer doing much interesting. This is like the front of the network and the growth cones you can see, okay? But they are not advancing anymore, okay? So in this intermediate stage, the growth cones are just holding the network basically, but the network, as you will see, is still evolving, actually, okay? And then the, and after about four days, uh, this will lose the grip and everything will collapse on back onto the explant. All right. This very much looks branched. You're, you're saying unbranched and you're making a point, but I see branches everywhere. These are, there are some small side branches like this, okay? But, oh, no, no, but, on, the, but on the top right here, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so here, no. So, so, so here, uh, th th we're pretty sure that this is actually two axons which defasciculated here, okay? I see. It, you cannot really see it from this picture very well, but. Okay, so now I will show you how this, how the network evolves in this intermediate stage, okay, where the growth cones are already somewhere here on the top, yeah, you will not see them, and here you see then the structure of the network, uh, and you will see how it evolves over uh, 12 hours. So I hope it's visible, is it, is it, is it visible? Maybe it would, could be. Because I have a number of videos, so it's 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 better. Okay, so you already see that suddenly the network is much less dense. Okay, now it will jump back, and you will see how it started. Okay, like a much denser network. So what is happening? These are mostly individual axons, and progressively over 12 hours, they start forming bundles. Okay. So, so now you can already start see the formation of these big bundles, right? And then near the end, after 10 hours, you know, you have mostly big bundles and, and some smaller axons. So it really evolves quite dramatically. And the growth counts are not participating in it. Okay. May, may I ask a question? What's the background here? Is it some, some gel or is, in, is this in... It's a, it's, a, it's a glass plate covered with a, a generic... Uh, substrate for growth of neurons, laminin and polylysis. Uh, Martin? Yes? It's a question. How specific is this bonding to the axon uh, ident? I mean, if you would take axons from some other species, would it yes. also bundle? Or if you take some kind of just some artificial sticks inside or something, would it adhere to it as well? Is bundling or is it specific that it's they like bundle I to the same type of axon? It's like I said, it depends very much on the type of axon. Okay, so the oh. of axon from other neurons. Um, the olfactory sensory axons. Um, I don't think anybody studied what other types of axons it might adhere to because they are the only axons in the olfactory. I, I know, but just uh, for the mechanism, if they really yeah. have something specific that they find. It's, it's, it's not enough if one axon has the cell adhesion molecules. The other one must have also you know, other cell adhesion molecules that will talk to these ones, okay? So you must have mutually compatible types, yeah? Yeah, so, but you will, ha there are some types of axons that are not the same that will adhere to each other, okay? Mm -hmm. These adhesion molecular water and cadherin or? I, okay, I'll come to that a bit, okay? It's, uh, the, the, the short answer is we, 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 we don't know. <laughs> Okay, so 
So the network was coarsening in the video that you saw. Okay, we can we can analyze it. So here we did some image segmentation, and you can plot that the the total number, total length of this network, okay, goes down, right? Because you're forming the bundles, and the number of vertices that are marked here uh, also goes down with time. Yeah? So you have a smooth, uh, smoothly proceeding coarsening of the network. Now, what's so what's behind it? Okay, what, this dynamics that I showed you. So what we what we what we discovered is that is the axon zippering. Okay, so here is what is axon zippering. Here, uh, this is a sequence from top to down. Okay, with one minute intervals. Here he see two axons that are meeting here and adhere in this section. Okay, and as time goes on, uh, this point moves forward, meaning that the axons adhere to each other along a bigger length. Okay. Yeah? So they are forming progressively a longer adhered segment, okay? a zipper. Yeah? They are literally zippering together. Okay? So this is a zipper. This, is, this I will call the zipper vertex. Okay? And the zipper vertex can either advance, meaning that I am zippering, or recede, okay? and the axon would then unzipper, separate. Okay? Here is another example where we have two zippers running in opposite directions. And they change this initial configuration to this 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 configuration again over over like like twelve minutes. Okay, so the typical time scale is like dozen minutes. This in vivo or in vitro? This is ex vivo, is my yeah, collaborator Because normally say. axon covered by Schwant. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So these are, uh, but but okay. In vivo, uh, this type of axon is unmyelinated. Okay. Okay. So okay. it's it's quite consistent. Yeah, it's it's in vitro, but um, there are also no myelinating cells in view. And now, this is now an electron microscopy picture, okay, of the structure of the zipper. So here you can actually see a zipper formed by already two small fascicles of axons, right? They are starting to adhere here, and you know this can advance or recede depending on the forces. Uh, as opposed to that, there are also simple crossings, okay, that will not zipper. Okay. What is the radius of an axon? In of these ones, it's about 200 nanometers. These are very thin axons. Okay, so now I'm showing again the same video, and maybe after I, you know, primed you, maybe now you can actually see that there are continuously some zippering and unzippering processes throughout the network, okay, and overall the zippering dominates over the unzippering, okay? And that's why you get progressive fasciculation. Okay, so now we come to analysis. Uh, first, let's look at a static zipper, okay, that is formed and is not either advancing or receding. So therefore, the, the forces must be in balance, yeah? So one can formulate a simple mo vertex model, yeah? When we say we're interested in uh, the force balance at the vertex. What are the forces acting there? There is the, let's say it's a symmetric zipper, so the tensions in the two axons are the same. So there is the tension acting in this direction, in this direction, and there are both of these acting in the same direction in the zippered segment where I have two axons. Okay. So if we had only this, these tension forces could never balance. It could never be static. Okay. Why it can become static is that you have the force arising from adhesion. Okay, so this is marked here as S, and this is so we define it precisely as is the adhesion energy per unit length of the zippered segment of the axons. Okay, right. So that's energy per unit length gives you a force, and uh, the uh, now I and I want it to just so so I don't lose anybody. I I just want to you know write it in a very in a very clear simple way. So let's, let's say we have a uh, zipper that's formed like this. So these are some fixed points. Here's, these are two axons. Here is the vertex of the zipper. And now let's say this one has tension T1, tension T2. So therefore here I have tension T1 plus T2. Plus there will be this, this adhesive contribution. Okay? And now the total adhesion and uh, tension energy uh, is then equal to uh, the uh, 
tension 1 times the length of the segment, AV, uh, plus tension 2 times the length of this segment, uh, BV, okay, uh, plus T1, T2 times this, this length, so that's CV, okay, and minus, okay, S times the length of the adhered segment, CV, okay? Yeah, so increasing length, if I have tension, costs me energy, but if I adhere, I lower energy. And then this is then, uh, then, then it becomes, when in terms of this length, becomes T1 plus T2 minus S times CV plus these two contributions. So we can see that effectively you, you have some effective value of the tension that you can assign to the segment, which is the sum of these two tensions minus this adhesion energy. Okay? And if you do a vertical displacement uh, calculation, if you displace this vertex uh, in this direction by small displacement, then to first order the length of this does not change. So you don't change this contribution. So you see that the force arising from this adhesion energy is, is pointing always uh, parallel to the adhered segment. Okay. So now, if we if we believe yeah, that this is the necessary condition, then we have a simple force balance equilibrium at the static zipper. Uh, if you add this up, you see that uh, the adhesion strength must be two times tension times one must minus cosine of this angle between them. Okay. Which also means that if we if we measure this angle for some zipper, and if we know the tension, we can deduce the strength of this adhesion, okay, from this equation, which is what we did. And so here I'm showing, you know, our results, the tension is of the order of a nanonewton, okay, and the adhesion strength comes out to be about 100 piconewtons. This is, as far as we know, the first quantification of adhesion between axons. And relating to one uh, uh, question, uh, if you convert this adhesion strength to the adhesion energy density per unit area of the membrane in our system, you get values that are comparable to what people have measured for e cadherin mediated cell-cell adhesion. Okay? So, so the number we get is, is quite reasonable. We're not saying it's e cadherin, but it's... Okay, we tried with NCAM and that didn't work. Okay. Yes. 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 So this energy density, right? This is joules per meter square. You can convert it to number of cadherin bonds at e cadherin, uh, several, th like thousands. Okay, thousands. thousands. This S is newton per which length? Per unit? Per, per micrometer? Or for what is this? No, no. That's a force. But, but it depends on the length. No, no. The energy depends on the length, right? So. Yeah, the, the energy I was writing here, yeah. that's proportional to the length. Yeah, but if you want to assign a force to the vertex, you need something length. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now, now, now I'll show you how we actually measured the tension. Okay, <laughs> this was done with, with Frédéric Pensé at uh, ENS in Paris. Uh, and uh, this is pulling on an axon. Uh, with a red blood cell aspirated into a micropipette, okay, and the red blood cell is biotinylated, connect that connects to a streptavidin coated bead. The the axon culture is also biotinylated, so we have a bond. And uh, then you know if you if you deform it by some angle, then you will have a balance between the pulling force and the restoring tension, okay. And you can deduce the, the value of the tension like this, right? So actually the stiffness of the red blood cell as a force transducer is several hundred piconewtons per micrometer of lengthening of the red blood cell, which you must measure to use this, yes? Yeah, uh, this brings me to what I have in mind since some time. Don't you have a bending energy? I mean, you... Uh, it's okay, so so uh, as you could see from the configuration, so we like the previous picture, it was a very sharp bend, okay? For single axons, we're pretty sure that it's negligible. Okay, but exactly when you have thicker here. axons, thicker bundles, mm. yeah, then you will square quadratically, uh, and and at some point it it will become yeah. But what what I'm showing because is mainly for small axons. in this case, you could not infer the, the tension from the. Um, yeah, you're you're from completely the right. You're yeah. completely right. But for for small fascicles, uh, we think it's negligible. Actually, not right. This, this expression is still valid if you're bending. It's just that you have to 
define your angle. You have to define your mm. angle from the asymptotic shape and then the bending energy. Yeah, bending energy then, uh, the I agree, but provided you, provided you define your angle properly from the asymptotic straight shape, this is still valid. Since I'm there, I, I had another question. I okay, we, I can I can show you later. Maybe this is an offline discussion and we can move on. Yeah, so I had another question on the movie. You could see fairly large lateral fluctuations of yes. these axons. And when you look at this movie, they seem very stiff. So apparently there are very uh, non-equilibrium uh, energy um, production ah, mechanisms okay. that create these so, lateral so situations. So you're pointing out a problem we have with this method, which is it's too weak. <laughs> okay? It's too it's, weak. It's too weak. So yes. so the top forces we can exert are, sub, are, are a couple of piconewtons here, uh, or, okay? Or, 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 sorry, nanonewton, okay? And n no, the, and, the, and the, the main problem is not uh, that you pull on the pipette whatever force you want. The, the problem is that it detaches very easily, too easily from the beat. Okay, so uh, you don't see bigger deformations. Simply, I think it's at the end of this experiment, it actually detaches before you can get a significant lateral. Okay, that's technical reason. Otherwise, uh, you know, if you port with, uh, if you pull with multiple nanonewton forces in the network, as you will see in the next slides, it will it will move. Okay. So, but for, for these calibrated measurements, we use this, this method with Frank Pensee, and we, this is just an add. Come on, this is not the right. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is just an add. We, we ended up actually developing a whole package for automatically tracking you know, this thing, which is actually uh, some practical considerations. If you're somebody is doing you know, tracking of situations like this, you might want to take a look at our package to see uh, how, it, how it compares. And the precision that one needs to achieve is dozens of nanometers, okay, in this tracking, so that you get a good, good force measurement. Um, okay, so now I will show you actually uh, what happens when you pull with a larger force, okay, directly by grabbing with a micropipe that you don't know why, which, how big, how big, but it's big, okay. And then you can unzipper, okay. So here is a two zipped axons. We start pulling, they unzipper. Okay, then the pipette is released and they re-zipper back. Okay, so we have we can do induced unzippering, and when we release it, it comes back. And the angle, okay, uh, so you can think of it in terms of the previous scheme as there was some equilibrium angle value. Then we we def we changed it to a bigger one. So now the vertex is unhappy and tries to restore the small angle, which was the equilibrium. So it run up, runs up, decreasing the angle. And when we release it, okay, it then it then comes back and restores the the, the original angle. Okay, so it fits with this um, sort of simple force balance condition that I was showing before. And so we developed a model of the dynamics now. Okay, uh, of zippering, not just a static condition. And actually, uh, you know the the. the we, we considered several mechanisms of the energy dissipation when the zipper is moving, okay? And two of them can be formulated quite simply. Uh, so uh, there you expect, in general, uh, when the axon is elongating, okay, some, some, some viscous contribution from that that will be proportional to the strain rate, okay, of the axon elongation. And it's clear that this force will be acting along the direction of the axon, okay? So you can then do a dynamical correction to the tension if you have a moving situation, okay? And change the value of the tension depending on the strain rate. And you can also do a dynamical correction of this adhesion strength S because uh, when the vertex is moving, you expect there will be some deformation, some bending of the cytoskeleton when the vertex is moving. And then that you, you expect to contribute a dissipative force, which is along, along, acting along this direction, so we can combine it with this parameter S. Okay? And but this will be proportional to the velocity with which the, the, the zipper is moving. So when you actually include this in the force balance condition, not only the statics forces, but also the dissipative forces in this way, uh, you get some predictions for the dynamics that, that actually were fitting quite well the experiment from the previous video. Okay. 
but I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. And uh, then we you know, analyzed also how the trajectories of the axon zippering depend on the mechanism of the energy dissipation, but I think I, it's getting late. So now I just want to show you another example of induced unzippering, okay? And uh, so here there's a double zipper, yeah? And uh, we pulled uh, with two pipettes. And you can see the progressively occurring unzippering, okay? And here in the, in the end, they, the axons will completely separate. Okay, so now, now you can be sure that it was not branches, okay? Uh, there is some tether that got pulled out, okay? And the next one is here, last, last example. You know, similar scenario, so you expect now that this will run in this direction, right? Because we we increased the angle to a value that was that's bigger than the equilibrium one, so this should advance to, re to reduce the angle to the equilibrium one. And no nothing happens, right? I can l run it long, nothing happens. Why is that? So that's incompatible with the, with the simple model that I showed you, okay? So, so then in the end, you know, we went back to the electron microscopy, and you know, this is the configuration I showed before, and m most of the zippers look like this, but there are also some that look like this. Okay? So here the axons are entangled, and this can maybe advance like this, the, the, the vertex of the zipper, but it's, you know, it's difficult to make it recede. Okay? So this, is, this, this, we think, is a structural reason for why some of the zippers actually do not move. Okay, so now, you know, all I showed you was in culture, and we were very happy when, when, we, when we realized the relation to an old paper of, from Alan Roberts and Taylor, where they uh, did an electron microscopy study of neurites growing on the inside of a skin of a xenopus embryo, okay? And they made the following observation. When they measured the distribution of angles between the neurites, okay, they got a distribution with a big hole at low angles. Okay. So if you think of the growth, right, the neurites are, if the growth were isotropic, then you would expect uh, the, the, these angles to give you a flat distribution. Okay? If they preferentially grow in one direction, you would expect the distribution of angles to be actually peaked at low angles. Right? But you get the exact opposite. Yeah? How do you explain that? Their proposed explanation was actually that they proposed there must be something like zippering, okay? Um, and uh, so the scheme is like this, you know, you have a growth cone that encounters an axon, and then if this meeting angle, okay, is smaller than this equilibrium zipper angle that I defined before, then automatically there will be a zippered segment formed and it will advance until it reaches the equilibrium zipper angle, okay? So it means that you have an automatic mechanism through which you remove from the system uh, sharp contact angles, okay? And there's, there's a second, second implication of this, which has to do with, with crossing, okay? So uh, when, on the contrary, uh, you have a, a meeting angle that is bigger than the equilibrium zipper angle, then if you form a zippered segment, it will be unstable, okay? It will un be immediately unzipper, so you will not really form a good contact and, and crossing is a, is a quite likely outcome. So this actually gives you a prediction, okay? It gives you a prediction that if you take two randomly uh, occurring neurites that are now contacting each other in the system, uh, they, should, they should cross, okay, if the contact angle uh, uh, was bigger than the equilibrium zipper angle. In, there is some distribution of equilibrium zipper angles in the system, okay? And now if you calculate the cumulative function for that probability distribution, just telling, telling you the probability that two randomly uh, contacting neurons in your system have a contact angle that is uh, bigger than uh, the equilibrium angle for these particular neurites, okay, then it gives you a prediction 
for the probability of crossing of two neurons depending on their contact angle. I will say, I will say it again. So, and let me say it like this. Here, uh, this is a very simple thing. We took the uh, distribution of angles, okay, from uh, that was measured by Roberts and Taylor, okay, and simply calculated the cumulative function for this, right? Because this is mostly corresponding to mature zippers. So this is a measurement mostly of equilibrium angles of the zippers. And then uh, here is the, the cumulative uh, uh, probability distribution. And here are data points from uh, the Roberts paper. And the data points are the probability that the two neurites will cross if their incidence angle was this much. Okay. This is an outlier just for one measurement. Otherwise, it, it fits reasonably well. Okay. So, so this, you know, this even thinking about zippering in quite simple terms, immediately start giving giving you some prediction on the, on the network network level. Um, now, continuing more now on the on the on the network level. Um, so. Um, I showed you that the network was coarsening in our case. Now, now back to our system. Okay. Um, so you can ask, what is happening to distribution of the angles of the zipper angles in our case? Yeah, because the network evolves. Yes. So, so just the basic hypothesis that you have the distribution, underlying distribution of say, adhesion molecule that is even. It's known that uh, even in a monoculture of axons, the tensions will not be all the same. Yeah. So even if you have exactly the same adhesion parameter for all pairs of axons, you expect that there will be a variance of the equilibrium zipper angles. Yeah. Um, so so th this is actually you know, our distribution, not now Robert's distribution. At an early stage of the coursing of the network and a late stage, you can see that the distribution of, of the uh, zipper angles okay, in our systems, uh, actually the mean moves, uh, moves to lower values and the distribution becomes a bit more narrow. And we were able to reproduce this tendency, even sort of partially quantitatively, by uh, doing a, a simple. Yes? So, so, so if you draw, say, two axons from this distribution, they won't have the same number of addition molecules at the same density. So you take the lower one. How do you do the. No, in this analysis, we, ad we assumed that the adhesion strength was always the same in what I now will show the, you. But, the, but there was a distribution of tensions. Okay. Okay. So we took, in fact, a log-normal distribution of tensions that was compatible, and, and a fixed value of adhesion that gave us this distribution at an early time, and then we rescaled, okay, the distribution by saying, at a later time, okay, there are bigger fascicles, so you expect that the tension distribution will have a mean that is scaled with by the average number of the average size of the fascicle that we observe, okay. And the variance will go as square root of the average number of, of, of uh, axons in a fascicle. And then we also rescaled this adhesion parameter S that we're taking it fixed. Okay? How? If you imagine now two fascicles okay, that are adhering, and you ask the question, how does the adhesion strength depend on the size of the fascicles? Okay? The tension, we assume, goes just linearly with the number of axons. Okay? But the adhesion well, depends on the area. right? So there, it's natural to assume that it goes as a square root of the number of the axons in the fascicle. Okay? So if we do these two, you know, if we rescale the tension distribution and this fixed uh, adhesion strength in this way, we then convert this initial we can convert this initial distribution to these later ones, and it has the same tendency as the observed evolution of the distribution of zipper angles in the network. The well, you get it from the rescaling of the of the tension and so adhesion. It's because the fascicle get fatter. Yes. And so the adhesion is influenced less than the tension. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, continuing sort of on the network level, I have one more experimental result, which actually sort of nicely fits in this with everything that I was telling you before, uh, which is 
um, you know, typically in the downward system we see this coarsening. Okay, sometimes it doesn't coarsen much, but you know, it either advances or it's, it's, it doesn't doesn't change much. But in 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 this experiment, we actually see decoarsening of the network. Okay, and this is an experiment where Alain Alain and and, and uh, Kohali in his lab edit fetal bovine serum originally for a completely different reason. You know, they wanted to activate the growth cone more. <laughs> but what it turned out to do is uh, it induces rounding of the cells in this explant. Okay, and as a result, uh, the explant shrinks in terms of area and pulls on the axons, right? So here you see the explant before FBS was applied and here after, right? So this receded and it pulls on these axons. And the result is that what was here quite simple in this red area becomes expanded into these loops, okay? So compare this and this, okay? So this is decoarsening that was induced by increasing tension in the system. Okay. So that's like the opposite of what, what Pierre was, was saying. And also, there are some, also they did experiments where actually a, they added an inhibitor of actin polymerization expected to reduce tension and that on the contrary led to an increased rate of coarsening of the network. Okay? So again, this is again compatible with saying that the, the zippering uh, arises from competition of tension and adhesion, and if adhesion wins uh, over tension, you have, form you have progressive zippering and formation of fascicles, but if it's the other way, you start separating the axons. Um, so, but I want to come back to like this, this question, so that was, you know, what actually drives the coarsening of the network? Okay? It's, it's actually not so simple, because, you know, these zippers, uh, I showed you the time scale for the individual zippers was like dozen dozen minutes, okay? But the coarsening happens over many hours pro continuously, okay? So it's not just that at the beginning you had some zippers in disequilibrium and you waited until they equilibrate and that's why it was coarsening, right? The, the time scale of the coarsening is completely different from the time scale of these individual zippers, okay? So, uh, one nice mechanism which you know I'm now sort of working out to what extent it's really true for <laughs> this for our system. But you know here's an observation where you where in again in our system uh, that was studied experimentally in Paris, there is a, a loop, triangular loop formed by three segments, okay, of axons or axon fascicles, we cannot tell from the optical microscopy. And then over again five minutes. Uh, this loop shrank progressively to a single vertex, okay? So you had three vertice vertices in the network, and through this progressive shrinking, uh, it became one, okay? You eliminated uh, a loop. And uh, the, the mechanism that now we're thinking of that this occurs is, this is now a cartoon of a possible configuration corresponding to this, okay? And now, you know, imagine that, uh, for example, uh, you, um, you, uh, change the tension in the axons in such a way that uh, this angle that you have here in the geometry uh, becomes smaller uh, than the equilibrium zipper angle for these axons. Okay. Then these vertices are unhappy okay, and they try to fix it by advancing okay, so they can restore a bigger angle. But if you have this loop and all these vertices advance at the same time, then the geometry is invariant, right? The angles do not change. So even though the zippers are advancing, okay, uh, they cannot meet this equilibrium zipper angle and it must completely shrink to nothing, okay? So that's different from if you just have a single zipper, okay, which would now advance and stop at the equilibrium angle. But if you have a loop, because the geometry will be constant if all three vertices advance, okay, it will not be able to get to the equilibrium zipper angle and will proceed to complete zippering, okay, and elimination of the vertices. The others too. Doesn't yeah. look like it's invariant. Well, in th yeah, in this case, ma, this one is also advancing. Yeah, really. I later point the other one, 
but it seems that one starts and then somehow it often pulls, of course, if it starts on the other side. It's not that it's... It's not exactly responding to this, yeah. yeah. So uh, now I want to make, you know, some, and, and time is <laughs> can be short. So I just want to make, you know, some at least quick analogies to other coarsening in, in, in actually liquid foams where I think quite a few of you are familiar with the basic physics of foams or froths, right? Where uh, you have uh, the gas bubbles uh, surrounded by uh, liquid walls. The liquid walls are under tension. Uh, so and then there are these these vertices arising from from the from the uh, plateaus, and uh, there is the force balance at the vertices, right? So there are 120 degree angles because all three tensions in this case are the same. Uh, plus there is the pressure within the gas bubbles, and the system coarsens, and the mechanism is. Uh, that if you have bubbles that with fewer than six sides, then on average uh, the walls are uh, uh, convex, okay, the positive curvature, and then because of the Young-Laplace law, uh, it means that uh, the pressure of the gas inside such a bubble is higher than the pressure of the gas in the neighboring bubbles, okay, because if a curved interface, uh, Young-Laplace law gives you the difference of pressures proportional uh, to the curvature. So if you have such a situation in the liquid foam, okay, the gas will diffuse out because of the difference in pressures and this bubble will shrink to nothing. Okay? And this is the principal mechanism of coarsening in liquid foams. This is multiple bubbles being eliminated like this. Right? Now in our case, we have no pressure. Okay? Pressure is completely irrelevant because uh, these spaces between the axons are not enclosing space, right? So we don't have any differences in pressure at all, okay? So this shrinking cannot come, the shrinking of our loops cannot come from, you know, young Laplace law and curve boundary, no. But I showed you on the previous slide an alternative way, okay, that would predict that, the, that such loops are unstable toward shrinking, okay? So then topologically, you get quite uh, analogous uh, to some uh, physics of coarsening of foams and also you become related not in terms of coarsening but in terms of the mechanics of the network to epithelial vertex models okay some of you have worked on epithelial vertex models right so so you know that uh, for, this is a picture from a developing wing in the fly uh, so these are now cells really enclosing space right and these are uh, the, the cell walls forming uh, adherence junctions between the cells and this is this has been extensively st theoretically studied in terms of vertex models where uh, uh, you have not this energy function but an energy function with a quadratic term in area corresponding to elasticity but also a contribution that is basically a tension times the length of each of these bonds okay so that's exactly the same as we have here okay so, uh, you know, on this level, there is, okay, the correspondence. On the other hand, the axon networks are quite more complicated, okay? So, in the epithelial vertex models, once you know this picture, basically, you know everything, okay, uh, about how the system is connected, right? While in our system, uh, if, we, if you just have the optical picture of the network, okay, you, don't, you cannot tell from it uh, easily which segment is an individual axon, which is a thin bundle, where you have an entangled vertex, where you have a moving, movable vertex, okay? Uh, whether uh, when you see a loop, it has this configuration made from just three axons, or if it's something more complicated, okay? So if you want to then formulate vertex models on the network level, okay, uh, I, I, I sort of think of it as um, a, you know, a, a somewhat analogous to an epithelial vertex models, but which are then decorated with additional structural information, which must be taken into account uh, if you want to simulate, for example, the evolution of the network uh, using uh, such a vertex, vertex description. Um, and the topological processes, so I showed you the so-called, the analog of uh, the so-called uh, T2 topological process, which is the elimination of a loop or uh, expulsion of a cell in vertex models. 
There is also this T1 process that exchanges the walls between uh, cells, okay, or between, between gas bubbles. And what's funny is that in our system, if you try to implement the simple T1 process where you have two axons and you would con try to convert this to something that's linked, uh, not like vertically, but horizontally, uh, you would try to do it by unzippering it and reconnecting, but if you unzipper, the axons separate and you cannot get uh, to the final stage of the T1 process, okay? So in this, if you have this configuration, a very simple zipper, then you cannot actually achieve the simple T1 process. Yeah, so another sort of structural difference that will select only some of the topological processes that are known in the physics of foams or uh, epithelia. Uh, so, you know, it's not so simple to just say we have a model for one vertex and now we can directly understand the evolution of the network. Okay, and yeah, I think the second, the last part will be absent because I'm being out of time, but okay. <laughs> so here is uh, the conclusions for you know, this, the main part of the talk and I, I'm afraid for, <laughs> for the whole talk. So uh, I hope that I convinced you that this, this, uh, this axon shaft zippering okay, is something that can uh, alter the extent of fasciculation or defasciculation both in our system in culture and in some in vivo systems to which where I related to this old electron microscopy data and there are some other relations that I didn't show. <laughs> right? The zippering arises from the competition of mechanical tension and axon-axon adhesion and biologically the, the interesting thing is that the growth cone does not really participate in it but it can regulate it if the growth cone reacts to some signal and decides to increase the tension in the axon behind it as a result of encountering that signal, this will then lead to unzippering of the axon shaft behind the growth cone. Okay? So this is an indirect way in which the growth cone can regulate even axon shaft zippering. Okay? Um, and so this was done jointly with uh, the whole project was defined right from the beginning from, with, with Alain Tremblot and Coralie Fouquet from his Paris did a lot of these experiments. Frédéric Pensé was involved on, in, for the manipulations and Daniel Schmidt was uh, my PhD student and then a joint student with Alain Tremblot who did really most of, of this work and successfully defended his PhD in a, in a cotitel and, and actually Jürgen was one of the rapport, rapporteurs uh, for, uh, for that, that, that defense, so he, he knows this work uh, quite well. Um, this was the funding and so now, now the question is do I show at least, do I flash something for uh, the, the last part that was planned or? Flash something that uh, will uh, see the discussion I, I think is a good idea. Sorry, flash, flash, flash something, something okay. that we'll see the discussion. So uh, the, then, you know, the, the, the last part that I wanted to cover originally was a, actually a model of axon bundling that is controlled by the growth cone, okay? And it's older work that's preceding this work that we did with Alain Tambleau, where we started concentrating not on the growth cone, okay? <laughs> and it's a very simple model. I will not cover the biological motivation now, and uh, I will, so I will just, you know, you will not understand why it's well motivated biologically now. But so it's a very simple model of directed, interacted, uh, what interacting directed random walks, okay? Where we inject random walkers on this line, then they, uh, at each time step, they advance by one lattice unit in this direction, in the y direction, and they go randomly left or right if there are no other axons in vicinity. But if there in a, is another axon in the vicinity, then uh, the, this wal random walker will be biased to make uh, the step to the right, okay, depending on uh, some uh, effective interaction energy, adhesion energy parameter strength. Okay? So it's a Monte Carlo update scheme yeah, where uh, this walker makes uh, an attempt at each time step to left or right and the probability of accepting the move to the left or to the right 
uh, is parameterized uh, in, a in a Boltzmann factor way by the adhesion energy parameter between uh, the, uh, the axons. Okay? And the sort of the, the really the novel thing was here that we actually, not only that, but also we introduced turnover of the axons. So after some time corresponding biological to several months, these growing axons are killed, are removed from our simulation, but you have a constant you know, birth rate on this line, so you have some steady state number of total, total number of axons. Okay? So it's a system interacting directed random walks plus turnover of the whole paths. Okay? And uh, here is you know, how it looks like. Here is actually two types of axons which have different mutual adhesion energies. Okay? As this is a very early stage, you start, they start forming some fascicles. And this is a later stage going up to a bigger distance in Y. And you can then, then start see a formation of some mixed fascicles here, here that separated into more pure fascicles, here it mixed again, and so on. Okay? So you get this dynamics. And I will just say one thing, the most interesting thing that, that was, was for us, with why we spent quite a bit of time on it, was that uh, we found uh, very long time scales in this dynamics. Okay? So you would expect that the basic time scale for the evolution of the whole pattern that you get out of it uh, could be comparable to the lifetime of the axons. Okay, that, that's a sort of the turnover. And what we found was exactly the opposite. So in the limit where the axons are interacting very strongly, meaning that whenever they encounter each other, they will fasciculate and never defasciculate. Okay, this is actually this is some slow. Uh, no, sorry. So uh, here you see the, the, the evolution of the pattern okay, in the case of strong interactions and the approach to steady state okay, uh, then at, if you go to a high Y level uh, takes hundreds of these turnover times. Okay? If you calculate the autocorrelation time at watching the system at some high Y level in the steady state you get the same thing. Okay? Very, very large autocorrelation times. And uh, the sort of the way we came to understand it, and this is something now if I were to model you know this all over again, I would not necessarily do it the same way, but there is a there is a concept that came out of it which I think is quite relevant even if you do more realistic models of growth cone driven fasciculation, and that is the concept of the basins of the fascicles. Okay? So if you have this case where the, the axons interact strongly, it means that, for example, this fascicle at this Y level uh, has a basin that feeds it. Okay? So if you trace back the, all the axons in this fascicle, here's the leftmost, here's the rightmost, and now as long as these two are there, any new axon that is born in the space must necessarily end up in this fascicle. Okay? So now if the, the fascicle... That, that's only would be true maybe Everything is 2D right now. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay, I'm speaking about 2D, like in our culture system where it grow with growing on a glass plate. Now, if this axon, if this fascicle size were not fluctuating, there is no way you could get these long scales. Okay, these long scales actually come because because of the death and birth of axons. The the the, the basin size is fluctuating, and uh, when we actually did we did a model of um, analysis of just two neighboring uh, basins of two fascicles, okay? Uh, and we wrote some rate equations for the number of axons in each fascicle and the size of the basin and the size of the gap in between them. Then the, st the steady state of this model is symmetrical, so the total number of axons divided into two and the basins have the same size. And then you can study small perturbations around, okay, this stationary state and do a normal mode analysis of deviations from the normal state and you find far four, four fast modes and one slow mode and the slow mode corresponds to uh, an axon dying in this fascicle and a new, uh, new and a replacement axon joining the neighboring fascicle okay so you actually inc decreased the basin space of this one but increased the basin space of this one so there's an exchange of fascicle space okay that's coupled and 
this mode we found to be capable of generating these very long timescales. Okay? So we explained these very long timescales as a slow mode of the interaction of two vesicle basins that are fluctuating. And that's all. <laughs> Additional questions? So in the first part, you, you had this impression that everything is regulated that by tension, but it could be also regulated by change in adhesion. Can you mm -hmm. discriminate between the two? Um, so we studied that this eLife paper was mainly on the individual zippers, okay, which have time scales of, say, a dozen minutes. You don't expect the cell to be able to change dramatically the adhesion expression levels on that time scale, while the tension is known to vary on such time scales. No, but I was thinking more on the more, more in general. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Yes, it's another way, is the complementary way to regulate axon zippering is by changing the, the expression of cell adhesion molecules. Okay. So, but you cannot discriminate between the two in long time scales. You, you didn't. Mm. In, so let's, let's say the, the biologists do not have a good reason to think that in our culture the cell adhesion level expression was changing dramatically. That's you know I, I cannot judge this. Okay, mm -hmm. I, that's that's what what okay. what this is their their conclusion. Mm -hmm. okay. in, in the second part, uh, I mean there is a lot long very long time. So it's coarsening. I mean this is clearly a coarsening uh, model with this idea. I mean you you kill it, but. If you add not this renewal of axons, if you, basically, if you, if you add not what uh, this killing and renewal yes, of yes. axons is sim <laughs> simply coarsening in the POTS model, so that would be. But you're thinking now in terms of a one-dimensional system that evolves in time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So no, you can. Yes. So if you don't put the turnover, then you're exactly right. Okay. So yeah, so but but with the turnover it becomes interesting. Uh, okay, uh, then it's uh, not uh, equivalent to any one-dimensional model, uh, and you have this emergent time scale. If you think of this uh, POTS model, then you have a very long time scale. It's simply the the square of the size of the system. The, the but but in our case, that does not correspond to time uh, at all. Okay, it corresponds to the size of the fascicle as a function of the distance. Okay, sure, but I mean yeah, not to time. Yes, yeah. but I mean, so so basically, in your system, you you have this. I mean, if you don't put this renewal, you have this long time scale, and I think this is the renewal is basically acting on this long time scale, no? So cutting it off at some point. No, this what you're speaking about, uh, like that the 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 fascicle size goes as 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 the uh, square. Yes. Mm, okay. Yeah, that that we see that. Okay, definitely. But um, yeah, actually, the, the, but it's it's really, you know, the time in our system is really not equivalent to the time mm -hmm. in the model you're okay. thinking about. Okay, and so so in in our system, okay. this corresponds to large sizes, but so. there does not correspond to like long time scales. Okay, I mean, you can we can talk more. Uh, could you could you comment how much of this theory could be taken into three D? As well as the experiments, I'm not an experimentalist. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you I to three D in three D? Yes. Um, so the so the simple concept of the axon zipper remains relevant, and uh, you can you can build up. I mean, any individual zipper is necessarily two D if it's stable. Okay, mm -hmm. otherwise you cannot achieve force balance. Yeah, but yeah, if you have a zipper zipper like this, so here is zipper. Okay, here it can unzipper again, and now it can, it can go out of the plane, okay? So you have two axons that mm -hmm. come together here, and this is necessarily planar, planar, otherwise you cannot have force balance in three dimensions. But here, these two axons can split again, and can, one can go out of the blackboard, and the one can go behind the blackboard. So you can build three-dimensional networks from the same zipper that I was covering. Okay, in, in, in my analysis, yeah? but the network properties will be different from the network properties that I showed you here. So you gave in, <coughs> in vivo example, I had uh, um, a very similar question, and um, so I, I'm not an expert on this, so 
how much three dimensionality do you have in a in a in vivo system? Yeah. Because the topology in two D and three D of these networks must be very different. So that's why we were able to relate well to this old electron microscopy paper, which was neurites growing on in the skin of an embryo. And it okay, so when they're growing on the surface of a skin it's exactly again a two-dimensional situation uh, and that's why we had, there was very good correspond to our framework and culture on a glass plate. How, how would it be in the brain of... Uh, yeah, that, there, there of course it's different. Okay. okay. That's, there is, it's different. But also there are some like retina is also, you know, in, within the, mm. the like, let's say the inner plexiform layer is, is nearly two-dimensional. You know, there are, there are, there are some systems where, where even this 2D analysis uh, should be relevant. So, I think we need to wrap up now, David, if you, do you have a very important question? Uh, just, just a quick question. So, in the context of uh, this olfactory bulb, so, so the olfactory neurons are growing, and then, if I remember, they have to find, at some point, these glomeruli, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it has been shown that they go, indeed, in this bundle, and at some point, they have to separate, because they have to go to some specific glomeruli. So you think that there will be a signal that will mm -hmm. tell at, the, at this at the specific location, just guy, stop going together or stop going along and then, and then start to bifurcate? So I'm, I'm thinking of it as uh, they, they do have some propensity to mutually adhere even if they belong to different subtypes. Okay? Because these, these bundles that are formed in the olfactory nerve are of mixed type. Okay? But then, when it comes to the olfactory bulb, uh, it's overwritten <laughs> by some stronger signal. Okay, so you can imagine uh, it's not quite true, but you can imagine that each glomerulus would be sending out some some gradient, and now these growth columns would say, "Yeah, I want to adhere to this other axon, but I get a stronger guidance signal." Okay, that overwrites this generic weak mutual adhesion and they will separate and go their own way, okay? But uh, let me just add one more thing. The reason why we, in this last part, I, in these funny videos, I had these two species of axons is that we precisely wanted to address if the type-specific adhesion of axons, okay, can contribute to formation of p pure fascicles on the way to glomeruli, okay? But we were not able to connect it to the, the limited biological data we had from in vivo systems very well. Okay, so it remained more on a theoretical level, and you know, uh, then eventually one would one should sort of come back to the first part and include growth cones. Okay, so again, then one gets a picture of the growth of the system and not just some intermediate stage where the growth cones are already far away. Okay, let's thank the speaker. We have three minutes and 22 seconds of break. <laughs> nice. I missed the, the mechanism for loop instability. Add a little bit of convection as well. So, our uh, next speaker is Grant Leith from University of Leeds, where he is professor in applied math. He previously, year 2000, here uh, held a fellowship at the Universidad Carlos III de Madrid. And he was handpicked by the director of Los Alamos National Laboratory as the director's postdoc, 97 to 9. He completed in 
94 his PhD thesis at the uh, University of Cam Cambridge uh, Trinity College and also had a Knight Prize in 1992. So his research areas are uh, theoretical immuno immunology and kink stochastics. I read here. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, including Kevin Burridge, who some people here know, who couldn't come, but um, I've had messages from him recently, and he's um, hopefully recovered. He's coming back to the UK soon, so um, he can't be here, but uh, hopefully he'll be back as part of this community soon. So um, I said three stories. Uh, partly because I originally thought I had an hour and a quarter. I don't think I'll take that long now, um, but that's okay because um, the third story is on that poster there, so if I go through the third one quickly or skip it altogether, then you can read the poster and ask me about it later. Um, but I'll, I'll, ask, I'll talk about um, the first two things, Francis Salaturarensis, um, pathogenesis. It's just a simple story to give you an idea of the type of modeling that is done in what's now being coming called mathematical immunology. Um, and you might say the same about the second story. There's some uh, more interesting spatial dynamics, which is perhaps closer to the spirit of the rest of this conference. I can't try to explain the whole of immunology, the whole of modeling, the whole of uh, every aspect of any of these stories really, but I will try to at least mention the numerical computational part of each of these stories. Okay, so who are we? Um, this is a restaurant in Leeds. It's me in the middle at the back. Okay, so there's Karin and, and Martin, who are um, the two other permanent people. And everybody else in that photo is a PhD student, or was at that time. Um, Maria is now in New York. Um, so on my left in that photo is Remus, who made that poster there. Um, the far right is Jonti, who participated in um, the first story, which I'll tell you about. Um, so you might have heard about a referendum that was held in the UK. Uh, you'd be f have pleased to know that the, the um, decision of that referendum has not been implemented yet. So the UK still belongs to the European community, and in fact we can still get um, large research grants to fund international training networks to hire people like this to work on. Um, in this case, quantitative T-cell immunology and immunotherapy. That's what the quanti stands for. Okay. Um, on to the first part, which is Francis Salaturarensis. So that's a um, bacterium uh, which is of interest to these people. Um, Joe Gillard and Tom Laws in DSTL, though that's Defence Science and Technology Laboratories. You might have seen them in the news recently. They are based in Port and Down, close to Salisbury. Um, uh, Carmen Molina Paris, so, so she was on the, on the photo, and John T, as I said, is the student who has been working on this project. So um, DSTL partly pays his studentship, a, a scheme called CASE in the UK. So, well, uh, gram-negative might not be a word that means anything to you. It's a, it's a type of bacterium. Um, DSTL is interested in this because it can kill at incredibly low doses. Just a, a dozen or so actual bacteria, if you inhale them, could kill you. It invariably kills mice. Um, and it is available to baddies all over the world, and it could easily be sprayed over a city or something and cause... Um, mayhem. All right. That is so smooth. Okay. So um, basically, the story is as follows: um, the target of this bacterium is an alveolar macrophage, so a type of cell in the lung. Uh, initially, like most things that get brought into a macrophage, it's inside something called a phagosome, so a vesicle. 
okay? But this bacteria manages to escape that phagosome. Phagosomes, their job normally is to kill such things, but this particular bacteria in Francis Salaturensis escapes, and after that behaves somewhat like a, a typical virus, in that it's inside the cytosol of a cell and making copies of itself, okay? Bacteria actually cells, so it's actually cell division in this case, but um, eventually it makes enough copies of itself that the target cell, the alve alveolar macrophage, breaks apart, ruptures we call it. A burst would be a logical word, but burst is a word that's been used in other contexts. And the free bacteria are now available either to infect other uh, target cells, other macrophages in this case, or they might die, um, or they might migrate to different organs. So initially the um, the dose is in the lungs, okay, but eventually, after a few days, uh, you can find the bacteria in other organs. So um, when they do experiments like this with spacesuits in high security conditions, um, they can uh, kill mice. They would have died anyway after about four days, but you kill them one day, two day, three days, and you look in the liver, the spleen, and, and so on, wherever uh, you're capable of looking to see if you can find the bacteria and indeed you can. Okay, so there are other interesting aspects of this which I'll only allude to briefly, but not only does the bacteria manage to get inside a macrophage whose job is normally to kill such things, um, it evades that mechanism, but it also puts the macrophage into a, a kind of suppressed state, um, producing a chemical signal called TGF-beta, which also tells its neighboring macrophages to be in a, in a a deactivated state, not even just the resting state, a less than resting state. Okay, so that's indicated by this kind of green colour. Okay, on the other hand, um, sooner or later, the immune system does realise that something bad is happening. In particular, um, this type of rupturing event produces other chemical signals, um, interferon gamma notab notably, that do actually activate the, the immune system, activate macrophages and bring T cells to the, to the area. But what happens, certainly in mice and even in people, is that that response comes too late and too much. So um, it's not the bacteria that kills the mice, it's the um, overzealous immune response which comes too late, which actually eats, the own, uh, the, eats its own organs. That's typically the case in lots of these terrible diseases that it's our own immune system that actually kills us in the end. Okay, so um, we can make a fairly nice agent-based model of this. Um, each cell has an identity, yes? Can you explain why the immune system isn't killing us? <laughs> Do you, normally. I mean, yeah, why it is killing us in this case? What's the, why this over response leads to people death? The, so literally, the, actually it's, it's um, neutrophils that are bad guys in this case. So millions, billions of neutrophils all go to the lung at the same time and they just eat the lung, right? Because they've, be, they've been told that there's a, a terrible emergency and, and that's what they have to do. Okay. So the immune system in general is a is something which you don't want to get out of control. It's like the Janissaries in the Ottoman Empire, right? You need, you need these soldiers to kill the bad guys, okay? But having these soldiers constantly around um, and waiting to be triggered, sometimes they go out of control and they kill, um, you know, the emperor. Um, okay, so back to the, 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 the basic story, which is, um, considering what happens from the beginning. Actually, sorry? No, this is an unusual, this is an unusual bacterium. Absolutely, exactly. So, so that's a, you said the human body could not evolutionally adapt to the immune system could not adapt to it. Aha, okay, so, so another good question. So indeed, so we have been co-evolving with bacteria and viruses for, you know, as long as we've existed as a species, and you might say even before that. Right, so um, some people like to describe it as an arms race. You know, viruses and bacteria keep finding new ways to evade the immune system, and the immune system keeps having to find new ways to fight back. And so, um, 
our immune system over the over the millennia gets gets better and better, but so do the bad guys. Yes. Yeah, so I've forgotten what the original question was. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's, so basically, let's come back to something which is less philosophical and a bit more mathematical. Um, there's a rate for cell division in, in the um, cytosol, call that beta. Um, there's also a rate for um, death in the cytosol, death of these bacterial um, uh, units or bacteria, they are cells, okay. Um, and then we need to describe this event where the host cell, the macrophage, says enough, um, I'm dying now, I'm rupturing, I'm releasing my contents, okay. so. You can see this happen in vitro, and um, sometimes there are hundreds of bacteria um, inside one macrophage at the moment when it ruptures. Okay, it's also possible for it to happen when there are only a few bacteria. Okay, so um, we decided that the rate at which this catastrophic event happens, this rupture happens, is proportional to the number of bacteria in um, the cytosol which is convenient later um, and okay so then the other thing we need for the agent based model is, is what happens to bacteria once they're extracellular once they're outside their host cells okay so they might go into another macrophage they might go they might die or they might migrate to a different organ okay so those are basically all the parameters of the agent based model and Oh yes, so this is a type of model which you can solve, at least conceptually, with a Gillespie algorithm. Okay, so basically there are eight types of events. Okay, so phagocytosis is when the bacterium goes into the macrophage and it's still in the phagosome. Escape is when the bacterium escapes from the phagosome to the cytosol, still inside the cell. Replication is when the bacterium divides. Um, rupture is when the whole cell breaks out the macrophage cell releasing all its contents death is when a bacterium dies migration is when a bacterium goes from one organ to another usually lung to somewhere else in this case suppression is this business of um, a macrophage which has been suppressed or is put into this deactivated state um, influencing its neighbors to also go into a deactivated state and activation is, is the, the contrary, where, where there's some chemical signal which causes a cell to become activated and therefore capable of actually killing these bacteria. Okay, so base, eight basic events and in the first version of the agent-based model which I'm showing here, there were three spatial compartments because those were, the, those were what they measured. Okay, so you can say there are 24 basic events and the nature of the Gillespie algorithm is that at each time you divide the unit interval into subsets, 24 subsets in this case, the width of the interval is proportional to the rate associated with that event, and you simply um, ask your computer to throw a dart um, that could land anywhere between 0 and 1. If it lands in here, then that means the next event is suppression in the liver, okay, etc. So that's how the, the Gillespie algorithm works. There's an extra step in this case, which is if you decide that um, that's the event that happens in the next time step, then you also have to uh, choose which of the macrophages it happens to. Okay, so I couldn't um, show all the subdivisions in each color there, but that's the Gillespie algorithm in a nutshell in this case. Okay, Sorry, yeah. Ah, good, good. Okay, so I went over too fast. So first of all, you decide whether migration is the event, and then you decide where it's going to. Okay, so if it's in, in the simplest case, as I'm showing here, if there are only three compartments and you're in the lung and you migrate, then you can either go to the liver or the spleen and there's a, a weight associated with that. Indeed, you could. Yes, very, yeah, yes. That's right. Um, you might say that, but we're supposed to, at the end of the day, um, draw a curves through some experimental points, and they've got measurements in the, in the liver and the spleen and other organs later as well, so, so that's why we put it in. Yeah, but you're right, most of the action happens in the lung. Okay, all right, so 
Um, what about analysis as in pencil and paper analysis? So inside one macrophage, so, um, which is initially infected with one bacterium, you have a process which is kind of simple. It's a birth and death process. In fact, there's a lot more birth than death. The cells divide more than they die, okay? Which then comes to an end in a big catastrophe. Okay, so the only unusual thing, or slightly unusual thing from the point of view of Markov processes is that as well as the usual birth and death, you've got the possibility from any state of going to this death, um, this rupture state called B. Okay, so it's not a normal branching process because the catastrophe happens to all the individuals at the same time. But um, you might say it's only a small, um, a small generalization of it. Okay. So, in particular, you can ask, what's the probability that a macrophage survives up to time t? Survival function, okay? And if you think about it for a moment, because of the way we've defined the rates, s is a function of time, starts at 1 and then decreases, okay? And the rate of decrease is delta, which is that, um, uh, that parameter, times the mean of the number of macrophages at time, sorry, number of bacteria in the macrophage at time t. Okay, and actually, so S satisfies this differential equation, which is closed. Okay, so that might remind you if you're used to playing with probability generating functions of a type of equation that you see for probability generating functions. You can't do that this time because it's not a branching process, but just for the function S it still works. Okay, so there are interesting mathematical aspects to this. So I'm not originally an immunologist. Um, I'm happy to be doing stochastics, and it's actually um, interesting that sometimes, because of the nature of what we've been asked to model, we end up doing what I would consider to be interesting math that I would never have come across otherwise. Okay, and speaking of interesting stuff, so this is Jonty's work. Um, the um, sorry, the student who's on the on the end, and again, partly I mentioned these uh, students because. Uh, they're constantly graduating, so looking for postdocs, so uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you're hiring postdocs, okay? So the, the most important parameter you might have guessed is the birth rate in that Markov process. So how often do these bacteria divide, okay? And in the first paper we published, we just found some estimates in the literature which said that, roughly speaking, <coughs> the time for these bacteria to divide is six hours. So we put our rate as 1 over 6 um, hours, okay? In the second version, where we had more data, actually older data, and things measured in more organs, but by a different person, and so on, um, we, or actually John T, I'm not an expert on Bayesian or ABC methods, but he's becoming one, okay? He actually said, I'm not going to assume any values, I'm just going to fit them. And incredibly, I've never seen ABC work so well, um, so this is the prior distribution, this is the posterior distribution. So our previous guess of 1 over 6 is right there. Incredible. Okay. Um, on the other hand, the usual things come up. So for example, someone asked me about migration. So um, as you can imagine, uh, how often the migration, well, um, the rate of migration itself is not um, easy to fix, but the probability that you migrate instead of going back into another macrophage is, which means that if you plot the product of two parameters against another parameter, then you get a, a nice graph. Okay, someone mentioned that yesterday about um, something being proportional to A times B times X, and you can't find A and B separately, but you can, you can get the product A times B. So something exactly like that happens here. All right. Dorichi. So this is um, a little bit of philosophy before I move on to the next thing. So um, it's not obvious when you're doing something like immunology what scale you should work at. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff about molecules inside cells and signaling pathways and what happens on the surface of a cell, populations of cells and so on. Okay, And you might not know where to start, but in my opinion there is something which is natural, which is the fact that cells exist, okay? 
you can, you can invent scales and you can postulate scales and you might be right, you might be wrong, but no one can deny that cells exist. And therefore, the way you build your model should respect that. Okay? Unfortunately, there's a side effect of that. I'm, I'm not criticizing mathematicians here. I'm actually criticizing immunologists more. Okay, so people get Nobel Prizes for finding a new type of cell. Okay, so what they tend to do is find a new type of cell defined in some way and then assume that all cells defined in that way are the same. Okay, which is never the case. Every time you look at something important to do with a cell, even if you think you've separated it into separate populations, you'll find that there's a, an incredible heterogeneity from cell to cell. Okay? But if you do an agent-based model, I don't think that's a problem. You can have each cell with its identity, and they can be as different or as similar as you like according to the situation. Okay. All right, I better get on. So, yeah, this is, this is, this is a kind of an example of that. So, for example, if you measure on the surface of a cell, immunologists love to, to use flow cytometry. So you can get a, a population of cells, about 10,000 at a time. You put them through a machine, it goes through a, a laser beam one by one, and some sort of fluorescence is measured on the surface of a cell. Okay, so you get a number for each cell, which might be the number of receptors for a certain molecule or something like that. Okay? And invariably you find, uh, well, invariably they like to say that they've found a log normal distribution. Okay, so on a log scale, the distribution of this fluorescence, which is supposed to be proportional to the number of molecules on the surface, um, looks Gaussian. So whatever models we need to describe populations of cells need to have a mechanism by which such um, distributions are maintained. Okay, so you can try to do it um, mechanistically, which is what we should do in the long run, because everything that's on the surface is maintained by some production, probably in the nucleus or the Golgi or something like that, and trafficking to the surface, some dynamics on the surface, and then some, um, so what's the word, re-injection um, back, back into the cell, and also some destruction or perhaps um, re-expression, as they say. Okay? Um, so this is just a, a a simple computational model that, that does something like that. I mean, it's not trivial when you think about it to, to maintain a particular shape of a distribution. Okay, and these are experimental things where you just measure, this is CD25, IL2 receptor, CD69, which is an activation marker or various other things. So these are histograms, and then these are graphs where each dot is one cell. Okay, so in many ways, immunologists are not used to thinking one cell at a time, even though they constantly have data which is one cell at a time because they tend to put um, crosshairs on these graphs and decide okay this cell is this type and that cell is that type. All right um, okay so let's do the second part before it gets oh, it's already 12 o'clock before it gets too late okay so I'm going to talk about the um, interactions of T cells and dendritic cells in the lymph node let's see what the next slide says Okay, well, I'll just give you a quick introduction first. Don't worry if you don't understand this yet. I'll, I'll, I'll explain a few more things. Okay, so naive angiogen-specific T cells. Um, like I said, I'll explain a bit more of that when I have time. Um, interact with antigen-bearing dendritic cells in these things called lymph nodes. Okay, so if, if, if you're like me and you didn't grow up or you didn't do study medicine or anything like that, then you only notice lymph nodes when you're feeling ill and you get these little swellings on your neck or under your arm or something like that. So the lymph nodes literally get bigger when you're feeling ill. And those are the places where T cells meet dendritic cells. Um, I'll come back to that later. So let's do the next slide because this is the one. Okay, so this is um, taken from an immunology textbook called Janeway, uh, Molecular Biology of the Cell. So all, all immunologists read this book. Okay. Um, the amazing thing about immunology books is that they bring out a new edition about once every two years, and there are big differences every two years. Okay. And they don't apologize. They don't say, oh, sorry, we made a mistake. This cell doesn't go there anymore. It goes somewhere else. They just bring out a new edition and say, this is what, this is what happens. Right? Um, and I, I, I actually, I like to astound them if I'm talking to them by saying, we could bring back a mathematician from the 19th century, and about the only undergraduate mathematics course that mathematician could not teach at the University of Leeds would be mathematical biology. Everything else is still pretty much 
as it was because mathematics is like that, okay? Whereas nobody knew any of this until the 1970s. Nobody knew any of this, right? And we still don't really figure, under, understand it. But what we're supposed to believe is that, suppose you've got a cut on your skin. This is supposed to be cut on your skin. So some bad guys like this Francis Salatularensis or some, something else gets into your body. Okay, so there are cells, antigen-presenting cells in general, dendritic cells as, a, as an example, whose job it is to um, ingest the bad guys or ingest anything they find, to be honest. And uh, then they say, express it, so present it back on their surface, okay, on top of an MHC molecule, which is another complication they, they, they always love to mention. So these things are floating around the body, and then they go to the, the lymph node, which is where they find the T cells. So the T cells are the good guys, okay? So, you, so we have lots and lots of T cells in our body with molecules on their surface called T cell receptors, and you should think of those receptors as being the lock waiting for the right key. So lots of T cells circulate around your body for years, decades, never get unlocked. But one day, sometime, a dendritic cell might have something on the surface which is the key that fits the lock. And once that um, key goes in the lock, the T cell gets activated, makes copies of itself, and temporarily you have, um, instead of a few dozen, you have thousands, tens of thousands of cells um, that are capable of, of recognizing that particular thing in your body. Okay, so. That can only happen if the right T cell finds the right dendritic cell quickly enough, a day or two, okay? So that's why we have these special locations all through our bodies called lymph nodes, which are where these cells go and meet each other and talk to each other. It's like speed dating. Most of the time there's no reaction, they don't like each other, but every now and then the lock fits the key and that's really important for saving your life. Yes? Sorry, general question. How then does the T cell know the site of infection, like the spatial information? Uh, and so at this moment it doesn't. Right. Exactly, exactly. So th these types of questions are really good questions. So there are different types of T cells. Okay. Um, so for example, um, if you get um, something on your skin, as is depicted here, and that activates your adaptive immune system and you successfully fight that um, infection, then um, the next time you get infected by the same type of thing, you can fight it off more successfully. Okay, so why is that? Well, two reasons. First of all, that the, the balance of the repertoire is, <coughs> is skewed. Okay, so there are, <coughs> there are more T cells that are specific for this after the infection than before. But secondly, because they decide to reside in different places. So this is actually only the last 10 years maximum, maybe even five years. They're very excited about these things called tissue resident memory cells. Okay, so there will be some T cells specific for this particular bug who now decide to reside in the skin. Okay, okay. so that's, that's one way. There, and there are all sorts of interesting ways which people are discovering all the time, yeah. How do they know that it was in the skin? Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. How do they know? So, um, so a little bit more detail. So, the, the activation happens in the, in the lymph nodes, okay? The, the initial burst of proliferation, so you get lots of cells specific, is still usually in the lymph node, okay? But then these cells leave the lymph node, they express a certain type of molecule which allows them to go to different parts of the body, okay? So they still don't know where the infection is, but they, cir they circulate around the body until they come to the skin. And then they notice, oh, there's lots of this stuff here. Okay, I'm gonna stay here and kill it, okay? So they stay here and kill it, and then um, after the infection is gone, they don't all die. Some of them carry on and there's a population maintained, okay? So they, an individual cell doesn't have to know anything, it just has to have, the system just has to be organized in a certain way. The macrophages, okay, so this, this story is about dendritic cells now. Yep, <laughs> sorry, yep. So, the, the, yeah, dendritic cells circulate throughout the body and there are always some in the skin. Yes. Ah, no, exactly. So, no, that's the point. So there's, there's, there are already T cells tissue resident memory cells waiting in the skin so they can probably deal with it 
without having to go through the step the next time. So that's why the, the, the immune reaction is, is faster and more efficient the second time around. That's one type of, of what's called memory, which is the reason that this, this, the field has its name, because you, you can be immune to things. You can fight things better the second time than the first. Okay, I'm not going to get anywhere near to the end of this talk, but never mind, this is great. I don't mind questions. Okay, so what can we do? Well, what's the first thing we tried to do? So, let's have a spherical cow, spherical lymph node, okay? The point is there is a confined space in which two types of cells have to meet, okay? Um, dendritic cells are relatively large cells, T cells are relatively small cells, okay? So the relatively small blue dots have to find the relatively large green spheres inside a confined space, okay? So how long does that take? roughly speaking, okay? Um, so the simplest model motivated by, by video, so, so another thing which is worth explaining is that um, we live in a kind of um, moment in science where new things are possible. So I, I think a lot of science became possible once we had a telescope. So you can point a telescope at the sky, you can point a telescope at, at, at ships at sea and so on, and you can see things that you didn't see before. Okay? And in our time, in our lifetime, people can see inside our own bodies things that we couldn't see before, or inside the bodies of mice and so on. Okay? So literally you can, without killing the mouse, you can open up its stomach and expose a lymph node under a two photon microscope and see what's happening. Okay, so I say literally, although it's not literally, because you have to be incredibly clever. You have to label the cells in some way such that they fluoresce. Okay? Nevertheless, you can see actual cells moving in actual lymph nodes in actual living mice. And you make, they make videos, and it really looks like these cells are moving around in a Brownian way. Okay, so let's take that as our, as our hypothesis. And now we've only got um, three parameters. So we've got um, capital R, which is the radius of this sphere, or in general, the length scale of the lymph node itself, the confined region within which all this is happening. We've got B, which is the radius of the dendritic cell, which is the relatively large cell. And assuming that the T cell is small enough, we're going to call it a point particle. Okay, we just have to know how fast the T cell moves or what the diffusivity is. So that's our capital D. So there's just three parameters. We're looking for a time scale. So we have to have one over D to get time. Okay, and to cancel out the R squared or the length squared. Well, there's only, there are many ways to do it, but if you do the, if you do, if you solve the diffusion equation to figure out how long it takes to find something inside a confined region, then you get R cubed over BD. Okay, and the factor one third that depends on the geometry, but basically the simplest case is if the target is exactly in the middle, and then it's an easy calculation that you can give to undergraduates. If it's not that simple, then you have to do some integration, and the one third won't be one third anymore, but you'll still get the R cubed over BD. Okay, so I have a time scale, is what I'm saying. All right, let's go back to the experiments for a minute. Okay, so. Um, MHC was this molecule on the surface. The, the experiment is incredibly clever, like most of these immunological experiments. So you breed a mouse that doesn't have its own T cells, okay? Why would you want to do that? Because you can take cells from another mouse, which is bred such that its T cells fluoresce, take them out of the, that mouse and inject them into the mouse that doesn't have its own T cells, okay? So now you can see the T cells in that mouse. Okay. Similarly, you can breed a mouse that doesn't have the right dendritic cells. Why would you want to do that? You can keep it alive in the lab because it's not exposed to um, pathogens, so that you can take dendritic cells from another mouse and inject them, and then in a way that they fluoresce, so that you can see them. Okay, so now you can see in a mouse the dendritic cells and the T cells. Okay, it gets better. You can breed a mouse that only has one type of T-cell. So most of us have millions, maybe hundreds of millions of different T-cells, meaning the TCR on the surface is recognizing something different. You can breed mice that only have one type of T-cell, okay? And take cells out of that mice, mouse and inject them into your T-cell free mouse. Okay, so now you know all the T-cells that you can see have a particular specificity. 
what's coming next. Now you can inject that mouse with the particular peptide, with the, with the, the pathogen, or bit of a pathogen, that that T cell recognises. Okay, so, so you, not, well, not people like you or me, but people much cleverer than us, can do these experiments and you can see everything in principle and you know exactly when you challenge the mouse. Okay, so... Um, Ah, I'm coming, oh good, I'm coming to that, yes, very good. Okay, so, um, so here's these special mouse, mice with their, without their own T-cells. You inject um, the, the dendritic cells and the T-cells, um, nothing happens because they're not recognising each other until you inject the peptide. And that's just after you've started the imaging. Okay, so you've, so you've, the mouse is anaesthetised, lying like this with its stomach open and the, and the two photomicroscopes looking at its lymph node. Now inject the peptide and see what happens. Okay, so see what happens um, literally first. Like, so some poor person, postdoc in Philippe Bousseau's lab, stares at these images and the green smudgy things are dendritic cells and the red smudgy things are T cells. Okay, and literally they look at them and they figure out what fraction of them are in contact with each other. Okay, so you get graphs like this. Okay, so this is time. Here's zero is not um, at the beginning because remember they start the imaging before they inject the peptide. Okay, so before time zero, just by chance, some cells happen to be close to each other. But as time goes on, you see more and more T cells closer to dendritic cells. Okay, so that's one way. Um, secondly, you can, and now unfortunately you have to kill the mouse, you can stop the experiment after, when did they do it? Ah, 30 minutes, okay, after 30 minutes, take the lymph node out of the mouse, um, get all the T cells out of a mouse, put it through a flow cytometer, which is measuring a particular type of staining, which is indicative that that T cell is activated. So that's the second way, and then you get a graph like this, okay. And now it's not against time, because everything is half an hour here. It's against the number of dendritic cells that they activated, that they injected. Okay, so you can choose how many cells you inject into a mouse. Okay, so which, which comes to the thing that which they were asking us to quantitate. You know, what can, what can we possibly contribute to this incredibly sophisticated experiment? Okay, so <coughs> there is kind of a fundamental question, which is how many dendritic cells do you need? In, in, well, your whole body or in one of these lymph nodes, okay? Um, they can control how many dendritic cells they inject, okay? It's kind of inexact, they, they inject, let's say, a million. Um, yeah, here we go, in millions. Um, they wait 24 hours, so they don't know how many of those make it to the lymph node. You can only see one small part of the lymph node anyway. So it's, it's kind of complicated, but at least there's some proportionality here. The more you inject, the more make it to the lymph node. Okay, so let's go back to our simple BS calculation. <coughs> okay, so we've got a time scale. Um, it was R cubed over 3 dB, so now I'm going to have a rate which is 3 dB over R cubed. And I'm going to make a further simplification, which is that the probability of not finding, a, uh, of not encountering anything before time t is e to the minus alpha t. So I'm assuming that the, the, the probability density is exponential, which is another approximation. Okay. And if there are A targets, A dendritic cells, capital A, instead of just one, then the probability of not finding any of them before time t is e to the minus alpha times A times t. Okay, now suppose there are n little blue dots and capital A bigger green spheres. Okay, what's the probability that none of the blue dots has found any of the um, green spheres before time t? Roughly this. Okay, so now as um, Philippe Bousseau had this um, eureka moment after he'd been talking to us for, a, for a, a year and a half or so, he said, ah, I see there's a difference between a mathematical formula and a computational model. Because to him it's all just what we do, right? Okay, so here's, here's a simple computational model where I literally have these targets and these um, walkers running around trying to find each other, okay? And the distribution of times where these events happen doesn't have to be exponential, right? It is what it is, 
Okay? And here's my formula, which is an approximation of that. Okay? The question, of course, is, is it an approximation of what we're interested in? Okay, so we're interested in two things. One is what they call the experimental model. Okay, so now it's our turn to, to have an, a eureka moment. Okay, so an experimental model, to us, this is the holy grail, this is reality, because it's an actual mouse, it's actual cells, and so on. But actually, their model is completely BS as well. Okay, so you do not have millions of T cells with the same specificity in, your, in, a, in a mouse's body normally. There's only one or two, okay? So they inject thousands, millions of T cells just with one type into the mouse at one time. Why? Because otherwise they can't find them, okay? Circulate around the whole body. Some of them go to the lymph node. You inf uh, uh, visualize a small part of the lymph node. You want to see some T cells, so you put gazillions of them in there, okay? The same thing with the dendritic cells. They put far more than would normally be there, okay? So we are actually interested in what happens in our bodies under normal conditions, okay, when there are extremely few dendritic cells and extremely few T cells, okay, and actually this type of computational model starts to become almost believable in those situations, okay, so if, if my lymph node is absolutely stuffed full of these targets and, the, and these T cells, then these types of approximations are not very good, but if there's only a handful in a fairly big region, then it's actually a pretty good approximation, okay. All right, so the point is, the experiment is done over a time scale of about 30 minutes, and they, can, they reckon there are about 10 to the 4 targets in the um, lymph node, okay? And they can't scale down to real physiology when you wait 24 hours to see if anything has found anything else, and when there are only a few, we don't know how many yet, dendritic cells inside the lymph node, and probably only one or two of the, of the right T cells in the lymph node. Okay, but of course, computational model, we can scale it down. In fact, it's easier for us to do so. It's easier for us to do it when there are only a few targets and only a few T cells. Okay, so here we go. Um, probability A T cell doesn't find any of the targets. Okay, what about the time at which a T cell has a 50% chance of having encountered at least one of the APCs? Here we go. Log 2 divided by alpha A. Okay, so alpha is a rate, 1 over alpha is a time. <coughs> um, therefore, we can write down a formula to answer the question which they asked us to answer, which is how many APCs should there be available in order that a, a T cell has a 50% chance of finding the right <coughs> dendritic cell in 24 hours, or in time T in general. Okay, so there it is. So that's good. And it turns out that this is actually um, an interesting um, formula. I mean, interesting to people like Philippe Rousseau. Because, remember, so top right, um, our time scale was r cubed over 3 dB. Okay, our, sorry, that was our, yeah, our time scale is r cubed over 3 dB. Okay, so we've got our rates, 3 dB over r cubed. Okay, what's volume? Volume is um, 4 pi, what, 4 over 3 pi r cubed, something like that, right? Okay, so what you're saying is that the um, number of dendritic cells that you need is actually um, proportional to the number of uh, T cells per unit volume. Fine, that's good. Okay, so normally we know how many T cells there are in a lymph node. So how many T cells are of that particular specificity is something that immunologists like to talk about. It's called the precursor frequency. So out of a million cells in your body, um, one of them might be specific for Ebola, for example. That would be a precursor frequency. Okay, so this is this precursor frequency, which is right there, which again tells us something interesting. Well, I, I better move on, but basically there's this number, which is about 83, which is the number of dendritic cells that you need. Okay, and it doesn't depend on the animal or on the size of the lymph node. So you might imagine that the answer to this question depends on how big the lymph node is, okay? But it turns out it doesn't. All right, now, oh yes, okay, so um, why might it be that the movement of cells inside a lymph node is Brownian or seems to be Brownian? Okay, there's actually discussion about this at, at immunology conferences. Okay, so some people are convinced that 
there is a, a static network, well, sorry, there is a static network inside lymph nodes, reticular fibroblastic cells make up this network, which is kind of like spaghetti. So it's random but frozen, okay? And there's something called IL-7, which is available on, these, on the surface of these cells, so there are reasons to believe that T cells prefer to walk along this network, okay? So again, computationally, we can make a simulation of this, we can make a network, so now the blue dots are not um, cells, they're just vertices of the network so you can see where they are. And there's just one cell which is wandering along this. So if there are enough twists and turns, then that motion is going to look like Brownian motion and you can figure out what the diffusivity might be. Okay. So, like I said, there's, this, there's um, controversy about whether this is actually the case. Um, and in fact, um, our contribution to that is that um, you can't really make this hypothesis work all the time, okay? So because either the network is incredibly dense, okay, or the network is, in, is incredibly sparse, and in neither case does everything fit together nicely. So, so the idea that the T cells always move on this network probably doesn't make sense. Okay, now it's time to stop probably. Shall I talk for a few more minutes? Okay. No, no, no. He's, he's giving me more time. <laughs> Ask the chairman's permission. Okay. So, all right. So, I'll talk a little bit about this. Okay. So, um, how many T cells are there in a human body? Um, the estimates are about 10 to the power 11. Okay. Which is, I love this, roughly the same number as the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay. So, um, in the same way that no poor graduate student in an astronomy department has had to sit in front of a photo of the Milky Way galaxy and count the stars from 1 to 10 to the power 11. Uh, nobody in any immunology, immunology lab has ever taken a person apart and counted the T cells from 1 to 10 to the 11. We always have to extrapolate from small samples. So we always have to f work out in the case of stars, how many can we see in the little sector of the sky and then multiply by the factor which, of which we think that represents. Okay? Immunologists love to take a blood sample from a person because that's the only thing you're allowed to do to a person who's not died in a car accident or anything like that and just assume that 2% of T cells are in the blood and therefore that gives you an estimate of how many T cells there are in the body. Okay? So you might say it's not a very good um, estimate. Okay? Like stars, mostly what we can see about from cells is what is on their surface or emitted from the surface. Okay? So you can't really go into a living cell, take it apart, see all its pieces, put it back again, and then see what it does next. Okay? You can't see, usually, the same cell at different times. I'm talking about the lifetime of a T cell, so T cells, individual T cells in a human body live for years. Okay, so you can't take a T cell of a person's body, look at it, okay, give it a label, put it back in the body and come back five years later and see what's happened in the meantime. It's just not possible. Okay, the same way with stars, we see one star one time. Okay, we believe individual stars live for hundreds of millions of years, okay, but we only see one thing one time. Okay, so what you have in, astro in astronomy <laughs> as an immunology Uh, graphs like this, okay, where one dot is one star, okay, this might be the main sequence, okay, HR diagram, so there's one axis is uh, luminosity and the other thing is to do with colour, okay, so we believe that individual stars move down this, or is it up, I can't remember, they move along this main sequence, okay, but we've never seen a star and then looked at it again 100 million years later to see where it's moved to. Okay? In the same way, every time immunologists measure, they take T cells out of, out, of a, out of blood, and they measure two things or multiple things on a surface, you can plot two at a time. So you get dots like this. Okay? And there are famous things from the thymus and from other parts of the body. And they believe that individual T cells move around this diagram in some way which is associated with their age and their function. Okay, but you can't see the same cell twice. So you have to deduce these things by what you know, including 
computational modeling motivated by basic physics and chemistry. All right, so um, a little bit more specifically. So why are T cells called T cells? Because they're made in the thymus. And in the thymus, there's this amazing process of gene recombination, which produces a massive diversity. Okay, so how do we have so many different types of T cells, um, which seem to be produced randomly? It's because they are produced randomly. Um, gene segments in the thymus are rearranged. Um, not all T cells are released to the thymus, that, to, to the periphery. That's another story. But interestingly, one T cell tends to have one T cell receptor on its surface. Okay, so that means something nice from a, a, a quantitative person's point of view. It's that the 10 to the 11 cells <coughs> in a person's body can be rigorously divided up into families. So you belong to the same family as a T cell with, with whom you share the same TCR. Okay, what that means is that there was an event sometime in your life when one or a group of T cells with that specificity came out of the thymus has been circulating around the rest of the body and either you are one of those cells or you are descended from one of those cells because if a T cell divides in your body then both daughter cells get the same TCR okay so the dynamics are very complicated but there's a kind of a rigorous classification which is nice for mathematicians um, oh and so the number of possible TCRs that could be produced by this um, gene recombination process is in um, street language astronomical even with even compared to 10 to the 11 okay so it's entirely possible in principle that I can have 10 to the 11 different T cells in my body from the 10 to the 11 different T cells in yours it's possible that there's no overlap whatsoever I don't believe that's the case but the numbers are big enough that that could happen okay so um, all right so I don't know where I'm going to stop. Let's talk for a couple more minutes so we can all have lunch. Nobody knows yet how many different types of T cells we, we have in our bodies, how many different TCRs. So most people agree that we have 10 to the 11 T cells. Yeah. I think so, yes. Yeah, I think zebrafish probably. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we could have... Um, 10 to the 11 different families. Every T cell could be different. Um, which would be interesting because mice are much smaller than us. They have b between, <coughs> they have, let's say, 10 to the 7 T cells. Okay, so um, how do you scale from a mouse to a man? Do you have um, the same number of specificities but 10 to the 4 times more cells? Or do you have um, 10 to the 4 times more specificities? If you could design this a priori, what would you do? Okay, what does nature do? It might not be the same thing. Okay, you might think people can measure this. Um, I, I don't think I'll talk about why they haven't yet man managed to measure it. So let's just do the do the maths, which is that um, there's a different way of thinking about this, which you would probably only th come across if you did computational modeling, which is that um, new families are produced by the thymus. Okay, everybody knows new, new T cells come out of the thymus, but it's actually new families. Okay, so if you can figure out how often new families come out of the thymus, what's the rate? People have got independent measurements of that or estimates of that. And if you can figure out how long a family lasts in the body, then you can work out how many families there are in the steady state, if there is such a thing. So, so let's say capital N is the number of T cells divided by the mean number of cells per clonotype. Okay, that's kind of obvious, it's just a definition. Okay, equivalently, N is equal to the product of the rate of release of new clonotypes from the thymus and the mean lifetime of a clonotype in the periphery. Okay, so the two, those are two quantities which you can seek to estimate independently and therefore get N from that. Yeah? Ah, okay, so, very good. Okay, so now I'm talking about, yes. Randomly generated, I mean, okay. I think, can it be that just random process? It must be it, something. It can be, okay, so in pathogen-free mice it is, right? But, and, and it, most of our T cells have never met their cognate antigen. Yeah, but is there some, probably in, in the genome encoded, something which is the, the most bacteria that we Very good, very good. Okay, so, the... 
the basic clonal selection hypothesis is that the thymus is completely blind. It just makes TCRs randomly, okay, and what it does is it tests them against your own peptides, your body, the peptides that are found in your own body. And any T cell that reacts to those self peptides is killed, and anything that doesn't is released to the periphery. So that's the only selection um, in the, the naive repertoire, it's called. Okay. Now, after that, what happens is that from time to time you get sick, or you eat something different, or whatever, right? And that rebalances your repertoire. But mostly that's changing the memory cells and not the naive cells. So it's still probably mostly true that the naive repertoire is, is unbiased in that sense. It's a result of what happens in the thymus, not what happens in the periphery. Okay. However, of course, nothing is ever quite that simple in, 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 in biology. Of course, logically, the thymus has somehow evolved to predict what happens to a typical human, at least living in Africa a million years ago. Um, so this, this process is probably not completely random, but that's another story. Okay, so last thing, I guess. So how could we figure out mathematically um, what to expect? Okay, so in, in one graph, this is it. So in a mouse, let's suppose eight cells with the same TCR come out of the thymus at some time when the mouse is two and a half months old. Okay, now it is, it is observed that T cells do not divide much in the periphery um, of a mouse. Okay, so therefore we have a simple death process. So if you know the average lifetime of a T cell in a mouse, then you can work out the average lifetime of a family of eight cells in a mouse. There are pretty good estimates for that. One T cell lives for about a month. One family that just obeys a death process will live for, let's say, um, two, three, four months. Okay, so now I have what I wanted, which is the estimate of the lifetime of a family. Okay, in a person there is lots of um, peripheral division, partly because we live longer. In fact, in my opinion, mostly because we just live longer than mice. Okay, so same story, but now we have a birth and death process which is nearly balanced, which is nearly neutral. Okay, so the birth rate is nearly equal to the death rate of a, of a family of T cells in the periphery of a human, the body of a human. Okay, so a typical story looks like this. Let's say eight cells came out of the thymus when we were about seven years old. Okay, the number of cells of that type is an integer, which we could in principle measure. Okay, it goes up and down by one at a time. A cell either dies or a cell divides. And eventually it goes to zero, let's say when we're 54 years old. Okay, and that's um, the story of a um, clonotype in the periphery. So you can work out the average of those and therefore figure out what happens. Okay, so I could show you the formulas but I don't have time. But anyway, I don't have to because you can work out the average of this and the average of this. I mean the average number um, over the lifetime of the family. Okay, so the average here is about three and the average here is maybe eight, nine. Okay, so um, what this says is that if you want to work out the number of T cell clonotypes in a mouse, you take the number of cells in a mouse, T cells in a mouse, and divide by, let's say, two. Okay, if you want to work out the number of T cell clonotypes in a human, you take the number of T cells in a human, and you divide by, well, let's say 10 for an order of magnitude. So if we have 10 to the 11 T cells, we have 10 to the 10, roughly, um, clonotypes. That's what you would conclude from this. Okay, so there are other things I can tell you, but it's probably better just to respond to uh, questions. Thank you. Okay. I think we're saying okay. yeah, About this I missed. How is the initial number chosen? Ah, good question. Because as we said, as, okay. we, as, as we saw before, if yes. the initial number is one, then you're very likely to lose it right away. Well, you, there's a certain problem. In, in a mouse, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. all that happens. Okay, so again, people, not me, uh, immunologists argue bitterly about this. Okay, so, and Depends what you mean, of course, again. So in the thymus, there's a rearrangement of a beta chain and an alpha chain, which are brought together to make a TCR, which is then tested and may be released, okay? And the question is how, so initially there's one cell. 
that cell divides some number of times in the thymus and then, then the family is released. Okay, the question is how many times does it divide in the thymus before it's released? So I put eight, assuming that there were three rounds of cell division. Okay, but there are some people who, who, who argue vehemently that it should be more than a hundred. And there are some people who argue vehemently that it should be one. So I don't know who's right. Yeah. If you, if you look at the distribution of uh, number of cells in clonotype, I think it's a very broad distribution. Yes. Or in you mean real like measurements? Yeah, for yes. example, okay. in zebrafish, if I remember okay. correctly, there was like e this even in zebrafish is broad. Okay, this power law distribution, no? something like that. Yeah. Okay. So all right. So to answer your question, you take a sample of blood from a person. Um, you can put that through a high throughput sequencing machine. Okay. So you might think, oh, we can answer this question. It's easy, right? Okay. So there are two problems. Out of a sample of blood from a person, you get of order 10 to the 6 cells. Okay, so that's a small sample compared to 10 to the 11. Okay, so even if you could give a complete census of what was in that blood sample, you'd still be in trouble. But it gets worse than that. So high throughput sequencing involves lysing all the cells together, taking out the RNA, putting all the RNA through a machine, and then getting a list of sequences. Okay, and then you have to decide, well not me, but the people who do this experiment, this measurement, which of those sequences are really sequences and which of them are errors, because there are always errors. So what happens is that they, if they only see a sequence once, they decide it's probably an error, so we better ignore it. Okay. Now you plot your histogram, number of occurrences versus number of sequences, and it's a big peak going up to one. So by throwing out all the ones that only occurred once, you've thrown out the largest part of your data. Okay. There's another problem, which is what I said about all the cells get lysed together, okay? So they're measuring RNA, not um, the sequence directly. So um, you don't know if you see um, a sequence twice in your sample, whether it came from two different cells or there was two RNA from the same cell. So you can't trust the number two on the histogram either, okay? Nevertheless, it's true that where at, at the right-hand side, where the numbers are large, it looks like a power law. Okay, so it's some histogram which is peaked at the back. Okay, so there is a solution, which is what's called single cell sequencing. Okay, so instead of taking your 10 to the 6 cells, lysing them all together, and then doing your uh, PCR and your sequencing, you take the cells out and you put one cell in this well, 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 and then you sequence each well separately. Okay, so that's incredibly interesting because if you have a sample, necessarily a small sample now, few hundred, maybe a few thousand cells, and you see the same TCR sequence in two different cells, then that tells you that that family was enormous in the, in the animal, person or, or mouse. Okay. But it, it also gives you an idea of why it's so hard to, to measure these things, a complete census. I think we should close this session. Thank the speaker again. And uh, we will reconvene at 1400 hours according to the faulty watch that you see to your right on the. So, this that last talk today. Okay, my pleasure to introduce next speaker, Yachira Mori, and uh, he is from uh, Minnesota, professor, and uh, he started his scientific career in Tokyo, graduated in 2002, then he moved in the United States, New York, and finished his PhD 2006, with 3D modeling of electrical cell. Then he decided, okay, I maybe move to Canada. I stay a short time, like two years in Canada, I get in position in Minnesota University, assistant professor, very shortly associate professor. And in this year, he got full professorship in university. 
Okay. Yeah. Thank. Well, th thank you for the uh, the cu the kind introduction and um, and uh, thank you for the organizers for uh, for having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to present uh, some of the work that I've done. Uh, <clears throat> my my primary goal today is to finish early. Uh, <laughs> by by the way, uh, it's, it's been a long day, and so uh, I only have about uh, thirty something slides. So uh, so uh, so I'll, I'll finish as quickly as possible. Uh, okay, so so uh, um, okay, so so I'll talk about some electrophysiology first. Uh, uh, so so uh, I mean, m most people here probably know about this kind of thing, but uh, just in case. Um, so so uh, one one of, th one of the first things we learn in electrophysiology is that the uh, the concentration of sodium and potassium chloride, the, these major ions, are very different uh, inside and outside the cell, and. Uh, and so, um, <coughs> and so, uh, so, so, the on the extracellular side, uh, it, the the dominant uh, positive ion is uh, is sodium, and in the inter and uh, in the intracellular side, the dominant uh, positive ion is potassium. Uh, chloride concentration is. Uh, Actually, outside the cell, chloride concentration is comparable to sodium concentration. So you can think of the extracellular concentration as mostly sodium chloride, uh, that is just salt. And uh, the intracellular sodium co chloride concentration varies from cell to cell. So, so this is uh, just one. Uh, in some cells, it could be about 5 millimolar. In other cells, it could be up to like 30, 40, 50 millimolar. I mean, the, the chloride concentration uh, varies between cell type. Uh, but anyway, the, the fact that the potassium concentration is very low outside and high inside, sodium concentration is high outside, and low inside is uh, actually a the the uh, uh, the fact that the potassium concentration is high inside is a universal feature of of biology. There is no exception. There there aren't a lot of things in biology that that, that don't have a lot of except that don't have exceptions. But this is something that doesn't have an exception at all. Uh, uh, so uh, so. It, uh, interesting fact. Anyway, so uh, so uh, the so again, the cell is a bag of okay. So for for electrophysiology purposes, the cell is a bag of electrolyte solution. So now, uh, so so there is this uh, big concentration differential across this, the cell membrane, and uh, and the uh, and our cells use a lot of chemical energy to maintain this concentration differential across the cell membrane, and so you might ask. Why, why, why does the cell have to do this? And uh, there are, uh, and, and in fact, uh, for example, uh, our, our brain, it is said that uh, uses 50% of its energy, uh, uh, the 50% of the brain's energy expenditure is used to maintain this, uh, this concentration differential. Now, now the, then the question is, wh why does the cell try to do this? Now, and this is, this is again not just uh, neurons where, of course, in the brain you might have the incentive to do this because the brain is an electrical organ. This is, this is done for every cell. So, so now, so, so the question is, wh why, why is this so important? And one answer, I mean, there are, there are different uh, reasons for this, but one of the reasons why this has to be done is because of cell volume control. And, and so I, I want to uh, first uh, talk about why cell volume control is c related to uh, this, uh, this difference in ionic concentration across the cell membrane. So, so, uh, so what, what is, what's, what's the deal with cell volume control? Well, so there are a lot of membrane impermeable solutes inside the cell. Uh, so they, these are small organic molecules, proteins, nucleic acid fragments, etc. And the cell membrane is permeable to water. Uh, so, uh, so water will tend to, because, because outside of the cell you don't have these small uh, molecules, water will tend to come into the cell, seep into the cell because the membrane is permeable to water. So, but, but it turns out the cell membrane is mechanically too weak to withstand significant osmotic pressure differences, and so if you leave the cell at that, then the cell will rupture. And so the question, so, so the cell must somehow combat these tendencies. Yes. Uh, that's a great question. I, I actually, I actually don't know the exact numbers. Pe I think it's on the order of about. I think usually it is said that. Oh, sorry. Usually it is said that the. Hmm, 
the, the difference in uh, uh, concentration, I think up to about 5 to 10 millimolar, you can withstand it. But then above that, it will rupture, I think. That's what people say. But, yes? I think I think I think so, but it also depends on. In your case, um, the 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 cilia is very thin, so so you could have very strong. Um, I mean, you have strong curvature, so you could have the, the curvature may be strong enough to be able to withstand it. It it could depend on the geometry of the of the membrane. I I do not know. This is a very good question. I I do not know. Um, and and by the way, I, I have to say there's also yes. Yes, yes, that's a good question too. Yes, so so that's a very good point. So 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 uh, cytoskeleton and the uh, and the acting cortex that underlies the uh, the membrane and so on have uh, ha can reinforce the membrane. And so it, it's not it's not entirely clear. I think it also probably depends on cell type how much osmo osmotic pressure uh, uh, membranes can withstand. Uh, it is reported some people report that you can actually throw. Uh, cells into a uh, very, very dilute solution and they will be able to withstand uh, 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 these you know, low osmo osmotic pressure environments for, for a while. So, so, so it, again, I think it probably also depends on cell type. Anyway, so, um, so, uh, so okay. So uh, uh, assuming that, again, the, the membrane can withstand some amount of osmotic pressure, maybe, again, depending on how much cytoskeletal enforcements you might, you might have, and so on and so forth. Uh, but let's say we take the very simplistic picture that the, uh, the membrane uh, is, is, ver is very, very weak. And, and this, this does happen in, in certain situations. Now, uh, so, so what, can, what can a cell do? Okay, so so the, this, uh, and, and again, the strategy depends on who you are. So if you are a plant cell, then what you do is you, uh, you build a cell wall around yourself and then you don't burst anymore. Uh, now, if, you're, if you are an animal cell, what you, if you build a cell wall around yourself, you can't move anymore. B yes? So so yes. The plant cell, they don't have this uh, difference in concentration? Yes, they do. They, 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 they still do. Okay. They still do, yes. They still do, but they, they have this, yes. Um, <coughs> yes? You had, I mean, I, I, I thought that, you know, the, the water at least feels some partial barrier, and that's why we had this aquaporin. Yes. C can yes. you explain yes. a little, a yes. little bit? Yes, this, yes, this yes. Aquaporins, yes. Actually, yeah, so aquaporins are there, and so, so uh, um, aquaporins will also, if you have aquaporins, yes, you can also increase water permeability, but membranes actually, so, um, Plasma membranes actually are permeable to water quite a bit, in fact. So, so this, this I do not know, but, but talking to experts, they tell me that even if you have a lot of aquaporin in the membrane, the, the water permeability of the membrane only will decrease by about a factor of seven. So, so, so let, let's, say, let, let's say you have, you, have the mem you have the plasma membrane and you put in lots of, you put in basically physiological amounts of aquaporin, you can only raise the membrane permeability to water by a factor of seven. Which is actually not so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's also a good question. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so so um, and and by the way, I, I uh, so so then so so s animals cannot do this. I mean, cannot afford to do this because afford to build a cell wall because they cannot move anymore. Animals are by definition things that animate, so they have to move. I guess. So so um, uh, so um, so so you, so animals have to come up with a different strategy. Now now by the way. Uh, I would I would add that there's there's a there's a third strategy that I didn't uh, put here, which is which is used not not which is used by uh, by uh, by protists by, by unicellular organisms, uh, and, and this involves uh, what's called the contractile vacuole, which is that uh, water comes in, and there's a mechanical pump that periodically pumps water out, and uh, and I learned that uh, Pierre is actually an expert on this, uh, so so I, I'm I'm uh, I'm hoping I can learn from him at some point about contractile vacuoles. Anyway, so, um, uh, so, so let, to, to understand what is happening with animals, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, write down an extremely simple, simplified uh, explanation. I'm going to go through an extremely simplified explanation first of how this works, and then we'll build a more, I'll talk about a more sophisticated mathematical model, 
of this. OK, so, so how, how does this extremely simple thing work? Well, so, so let's say the ionic concentrations outside the cell are predetermined. Uh, so outside the cell, we have a positive ionic concentration of 150. And I don't even have units here, but you can think of this as 150 millimole per liter, which is, uh, which is about the concentration we have in our body. So this is uh, of sodium. So here, I, I'm, I'm just lumping all positive ions and negative ions together and saying that this is just positive and negative ions. Uh, uh, just for, for simplicity here, this is an extremely crude ex explanation I'm going through. Okay, so, so let's say the positive ions is valence 1, negative ions have, have valence of negative 1. Okay? So the, the, uh, the positive ions, so, so uh, 150 millimole per liter, negative ions 150 millimole per liter, this is outside the cell. Okay? And so I add the 150 millimole per liters together, and uh, these ions are supposed to be uh, strong electrolytes so that they are completely uh, separated. Are dissociated so that uh, the uh, the total concentration or osmolite concentration is 300 millimole per liter. Yes. Just a question. I guess the concentration of ion outside the cell is also regulated. Yes, that that is that is true. That is true. This is a simplification. You're right. So I, I'm here assuming that. Yeah, that's a that's a good, very good point. Yes. But anyway, so, so let's say we do that, and then uh, and so so uh, we want we want charge neutrality. So so basically, positive and negative ions we have the same number of them. Okay, now, uh, so, so inside the cell we have proteins and other stuff. And proteins and other stuff are usually, uh, they are negatively charged. Uh, so um, the DNA uh, phosphate backbone is negatively charged. Uh, amino acids are typically negatively charged. So, so, um, so, 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 uh, so these organic stuff, let's say they are big molecules, they carry minus 10 ions each. And let's say we have 10 millimolars of those proteins inside this, inside or amino acids, whatever they are, inside the cell. So this is again very crude. Now, now the question I'm going to ask is, okay, now I want to. So let's say this kind of cell with 10 millimolar protein is thrown inside, thrown inside this kind of environment. What should the positive ionic and negative ionic concentrations of this cell? What does it have to be? In order to, in order for the cell not to burst. So this is the question I want to ask. Okay, and and the and the simple answer to this is, well, I, I take uh, so x and y are um, are my unknowns. I add this together, which is the osmotic pressure. This has to balance the outside osmotic pressure. So x plus y plus 10 equals 300, and then I say minus 100 plus x minus y has to be equal to zero because of electron neutrality. Okay, and then uh, I have two equations and two unknowns. I like to say that this is mathematical biology in action, OK? <laughs> and so we get x equals to 195 and 95. OK. Uh, OK, so, so, um, so now, now so, so what, 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 does this, what does this tell us? OK, so, so this tells us that in order to maintain cell volume, the cell has to maintain a greater concentration of positive ions on the outside and a lower concentration of negative ions than the outside. And, and this basically, in, in this schematic, more or less comes from the fact that uh, proteins are negatively charged. Now, now, uh, so, so now, now, how how does the cell do this then? Right. So, so how how can the cell achieve such a thing? Well, in fact, the cell is very clever. What it does, it it it, it sets up a negative voltage across the cell membrane. Now, now what what does this mean? Right. So, so, so if it, if the cell can set up a negative voltage across the cell membrane, then then. Uh, then negative ions would want to be outside instead of inside. Positive ions would tend to, tend to want to be inside rather than outside. And so you can set up, set up this kind of uh, difference in the sense that you have more positive ions inside than outside, less negative ions inside than outside. Okay. Now, now the question then is, OK, ne the next question is, how, do, how does a cell uh, generate this membrane potential? So. So the, uh, the, the answer to that is, again, something that I'm sure a lot of people here know, is that, uh, is that first, first, potassium ions are actively pumped into the cell so that the potassium concentration inside the cell is high compared to the outside. So that's step one. Step two, what you do is, the, uh, what the cell does is, the cell membrane, on the cell membrane you have potassium channels. And you have potassium channels, but not, 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 not uh, you so basically, in the simplest situation, you only have potassium channels on the, on the cell membrane. Okay? If you only have potassium channels on the cell membrane, 
what happens is potassium want to diffuse, would want to diffuse out because the potassium concentration inside is higher than the outside. But then as it diffuses out, right, uh, as it diffuses out, the uh, excess charge that, would, that comes from potassium diffusing out would, would, uh, would accumulate on the surfaces of the membrane. The membrane, again, acts as a capacitance, as, um, as, as we all learned from uh, 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 Jerome's talk and also from Jürgen's talk. Uh, so, and, uh, so, so at a certain point, uh, the, the membrane would, so, so at a certain point, the, uh, uh, the discharge accumulation would generate a difference in membrane potential, and then the, uh, the, the tendency for, so the tendency for the, for the ions who want to come back because of this voltage difference, and the tendency for the, uh, the ions to want to diffuse out because of concentration differences will balance out, and you get a membrane potential. So, so this is basically a diffusion potential. Uh, and, uh, and this diffusion potential is on, on the order of, so, and the potential you get is on the order of about minus 70 millivolts. And, and again, and again uh, as, as Eugen pointed out, uh, the, 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 the controlling voltage here is, is uh, the thermal voltage RT over F, so R being, so, uh, or KBT over Q. And uh, KBT over Q is about 25 millivolts, and that's why, that's why all voltages you see in, in biology is on the order of 25 millivolts. Okay, so, um, so, so, so what, is, what, have we, uh, what have we learned so far? So, uh, so what we've learned so far is that in order to maintain osmotic balance, the cell must extrude negative ions from the cell, has to have more positive ions inside the cell, and in order to do that, uh, the cell uh, maintains a negative voltage inside the cell with respect to the outside, and how that is done is that Potassium is actively pumped into the cell, and then you have potassium channels on the membrane, so you, you create a diffusion potential. So that, that's the story. Okay. Now, okay. So, so by the way, and this, this doesn't have very much to do with what the uh, with the rest of my talk today, uh, but uh, but in some sense, uh, if you take this view, excitable electrical activity that people all you know, I mean, neurophysiologists and so on, and cardiac electrophysiologists or whatever are interested in, is an evolutionary afterthought. So so. So, so what, what, really, what really came first is, um, is things like volume control and also biochemistry. It, it's, uh, it, it turns out that, um, so this, this is another story that I probably, uh, uh, that, that's not something that I really uh, am an expert on, but uh, it also turns out that some of the most important enzymes, uh, like ribosomal enzymes and so on and so forth, uh, can only function in a high potassium environment. And this is probably because uh, the, uh, the primordial cells that were born, like, I don't know, uh, four billion years ago, was somehow, uh, uh, somehow developed in a potassium-rich environment, so that, so that our cells really cannot function in a, they only function in a high potassium environment. That, that's, the, that's how our biochemistry works. So, so, so we can't, that's, that's something that we can't really um, uh, avoid. I mean, bi biological systems were built that way, so, so we can't really avoid it. So, so, the, so in some sense, uh, so this kind of thing, uh, these, these kinds of things basically uh, led to the, uh, the creation of a membrane potential and, and uh, excitable electrical activity like neurophysiology and so on was basically an afterthought. I mean, it was, the membrane potential was there at, at some point, uh, uh, at, at some evolutionary uh, stage in, in, in our in, 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 in the long evolutionary history of life on Earth, there, there was, there was this, some organism that was able to use this membrane potential to be able to do something useful, uh, interesting, uh, via electrical, electrical activity, and this, this led to uh, um, ac action potentials and so on. So, so um, yes? Just, just yeah. Do you know why it's not reverse action? Why it's not sodium and potassium? Why potassium? Uh, that's a great question. I have no idea. So, so there's a... There's a there's a, there's a very, very interesting uh, PNAS paper uh, from about, uh, I forget, um, 2000, yeah, about 10, 10 years ago, I, I don't remember, on, on the origin of life. And it talks about, um, it talks about, uh, it talks about where they think uh, life originated based in part on the, uh, on the postulate that it has to have, have happened from a potassium-rich environment. So, so, so uh, um, 
it's a it's a yeah I, I cannot do justice to this paper it's a very interesting paper I, I would uh, I would recommend that everybody here would read it. it it's a fun paper to read it's an interesting paper in the sense that for me it's interesting because uh, uh, it, it, there, it's all, it's all speculation but it's a it's a paper right but but I mean you know like things that happened four billion years ago I guess difficult to do experiments on anyway um, so so um, so uh, okay so um, another another question the, the second bullet point that I would I will return to later on is okay so so iron regulation as we just saw is very very closely related to cell volume control right? now now what is what does this what does this mean so what what could this mean could could this mean right so so let, let's say I have I have a cell then then if I can if I can increase the volume of my cell over here and decrease it over here maybe right okay, can yes so, so you yes say, uh, potassium is actively pumped into the cell it's not that sodium is extruded I mean you, you could yes yes P potassium is potassium is uh, is pumped in and sodium is extruded as well yes yeah that's but right. I mean if you think of yes it's really sodium that you extrude with yes yes so if you think that you are living in seawater Yes. Is the ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's right. That's right. That's right. So, so <laughs> basically, yeah. So, so I think the the okay. So, so according to this, um, I, I, you know, again, I cannot do justice to this kind of uh, evolutionary stuff. I mean, or rather, origin of life stuff. But so, so it seems one of the things. Okay, the 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 theory that I subscribe to. Okay, the theory that I think is cor correct, which I, of course, I do not. I cannot. I do not really have a lot of evidence for this, but uh, that is according, uh, which is basically just um, just this PNAS paper. Is that uh, life on Earth okay, uh, was born in these potassium-rich environments near near, near uh, volcanic? Uh, uh, there are there are only very few places on Earth where there's more potassium than sodium because I mean because there's a sea. Okay, so 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 uh, but but there are very limited places where this happens uh, it, near near certain kinds of volcanoes. Uh, it turns out, and 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 they claim that this is pla th these are the places where life actually. Uh, developed because that those are the only places where potassium you, you have a potassium rich environment and there are also other reasons for for why that might be true which I, I forget okay. now now the question is but then but then you know uh, but then life is only a local phenomenon that can only ha that is isolated in these places and you ask yourself how how could life become a, a global phenomenon well life had to venture into the sea if life would, would want to venture into the sea, it has to live in a sodium-rich environment. And now you have to, you have to be able to maintain a potassium-rich environment within a sodium-rich environment. And now you have to have sodium-potassium ATPases, ion channels, and so on and so forth. So the story that comes forth, if this is really true, is that, that ion channels, ion pumps, and so on were, were really the, the tools that were needed to make life a global phenomenon. Okay, this is not my story. Okay. <laughs> this is a story that, according to these people who wrote this paper, I, I'm sorry I forget uh, their, their, uh, uh, their, their names, but, uh, but if you're interested, please ask me. I'll find the reference and I can send it to you. Uh, anyway, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so, so what, I to, what I want to point out, which was this, uh, sorry, uh, which was, uh, sorry, sorry, which was this uh, uh, last bullet point here, is uh, is that okay? So let's say I have a cell, okay, and again, as I as as we we just uh, discussed, uh, uh, cell volume control and ionic regulation are very closely related. Uh, you you can imagine then that ionic regulation and cell movement might also be uh, related because if I have a round cell and let's say I increase my volume here and decrease my volume over here, then my my center of mass the center of mass of my cell has moved right? and so I've moved my cell. So, so, so basically just by getting water in and getting water out on the other side I can move my cell and if uh, cell volume control, and, and this is basically cell volume control, now if I, if I can regulate and if cell volume control can be regulated by uh, ionic concentrations there's this possibility that ionic concentrations may, regulation may be in, uh, very closely related in some sense, the cell movement. Oh, yes? Before you move to motility, yes. what exactly do you mean by cell volume control? Are you saying that there is a fixed volume that the cell always... Yeah, 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 that's right. So, so that, that's a good question. So, so, uh, 
Um, yes, that's right. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Yes. Uh, okay. So, so, but by the way, I, I'm not going to move on to cell movement yet. I, I'm going to talk about cell volume control for the mom for for a moment. Um, so the the very rough picture that I gave uh, using uh, uh, two equations and two unknowns is probably not very satisfactory for this audience. Uh, so uh, and and we are in a mathematical institute after all. So I thought I'd write some, some a few equations. So um, so this is called the pump leak model, which was uh, basically introduced in the 1960s by uh, uh, by um, people in, I think, Rockefeller, uh, Tostes and, and Hoffman, who were studying uh, uh, red cell volume control. Uh, so red, red blood cells were, uh, were the primary, the first system in which volume control was uh, really studied uh, carefully. So, so the, 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 uh, this, uh, this, this model is extremely simple. So you have uh, sodium concentration, so intracellular sodium concentration, intracellular potassium concentration, intracellular chloride concentration, and then I multiply by the volume V, that's the total amount of sodium, total amount of potassium, total amount of chloride I have. The, the, the rate of change of that is equal to this plus that. Okay, so what is this? So this first term is the sodium that is flowing through ion channels. And the second term is the, uh, is the is the, um, uh, is the sodium uh, flux that goes through ion pumps. Okay? And, and this, so, so the, the ion pump term, I'm just uh, here, uh, I'm just uh, 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 treating it to be just a constant. The, uh, the, the flux through the ion channels, this, these are passive, so, so they should be just, uh, they should be an increasing function of the, uh, uh, they should be just, they should be an increasing function of the, um, of the difference in chemical potential across the across the uh, across the cell membrane, and this is just the uh, difference in electrochemical potential across the cell membrane. And the easiest thing you can do is that the flux is going to be proportional to that. And this is uh, this is uh, also uh, uh, what in electrophysiology people call the uh, a linear current voltage relationship. And, and then you just uh, do that for potassium and chloride as well. The chloride doesn't have a pump. The three and two here. Uh, reflect the uh, stoichiometry of the sodium potassium ATPase, and, and so you have this very simple model. Now this phi is the membrane potential, it's the difference in potential across the cell membrane. And so, so how is the uh, how is the cell mem the membrane potential determined? The membrane potential is determined so that the sum of all the ions you have, the sum of all the charges you have inside the cell is equal to uh, capacitance times the uh, membrane voltage. This is the charge capacitance relationship that uh, Jurgen uh, talked about. Uh, in his in his talk, so this uh, Z A, where A, so A is the total amount of uh, impermeable impermeable ions you have inside the cell, and Z is the Z is the average valence of those guys. Okay, and then then you have uh, and then okay, so and then you have the equation for the volume. So the volume is the rate of change volume is the is equal to the transmembrane water flux. So, so the transmembrane water flux uh, is uh, in, in this model just proportional to the difference in osmotic pressure across the cell membrane. The osmotic pressure inside the cell is sodium potassium chloride plus the uh, osmotic pressure that comes from the impermeable solutes which is the total amount of solutes divided by the volume and then this is the uh, this is the concentra ionic concentration outside. He here I'm assuming only that, that we only have sodium, potassium, and chloride um, as our inorganic ions. Okay, so, so this is the model. Now, so, so just, uh, just so that we, we, uh, we know what we're doing, uh, volume, so, so we have, okay, so, so the extracellular concentration of sodium, potassium, and chloride are fixed. So the only unknown, the, uh, the un there are five unknowns we have here. Volume, sodium, potassium, chloride, and the voltage. And we have five equations and five unknowns, so, so presumably we can solve this system. Okay. Um, by the way, in the co okay, so I should say uh, so. So by the way, uh, um, these these pump leak models. So so this pump leak model may not be too familiar with 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 many of you, but uh, but the um, but uh, in fact, um, okay. So this is the charge capacitance relation that uh, that you can just. Uh, talked about and, and he and so and uh, if you take this equation and take the derivative of this with respect to v t on both sides, you get this uh, you get just a cable equation or, or, or circuit equation. 
So, so you can see that uh, this, this, uh, this model here actually uh, contains the usual electrical circuit model that people use in, uh, in, uh, in neurophysiology. In, in the context of cell volume control, the, the time scales are very, very long. I mean, it, it, I mean at least so much longer than th th things like uh, things like uh, things on the order of milli milliseconds, which, has, which are the time scales in which uh, action potentials fire and so on. So usually it's, it's, a, it's a very good approximation to take uh, this, uh, this CM to be equal to zero here. So, so what, we'll, what we will uh, discuss from, from here on is the, these five equations, but this set to be equal to zero. So CM is equal to zero. Of course, if you want to be a little bit more formal, you can do a non-dimensionalization and, and, and try to see what the small, small parameter is. And that small parameter turns out to be really very, very small. OK. Now, so, so, so in general, what, what's, the, what's the structure of this model? The structure of this model, if we non-dimensionalize, looks like this. So, so we, have, uh, we, have a, uh, we have n species of ions. In, in the previous model, we had uh, three. And, uh, and then uh, d, v, c, k, d, t. So there was one term that represented the ion, ion channel currents. And there was another term that represented the pump currents. The pump currents in, my, uh, in the simple model that I just described, p, k was not a function of phi or c. It was just a constant. But anyway, in, in general, it might depend on lots of different things. Uh, so this, is the, this was the ion channel uh, current. And then we had the electron neutrality condition. Okay. And then, uh, and then we had dVdt is equal to a water flux equation, which was a function of the difference in osmotic pressure across the cell membrane. Okay, so, so this was the equation. So we have a differential algebraic system with n plus 2 unknowns, v, c, 1 through cn, and phi. So n plus 1 differential equations with one algebraic constraint. Okay, so, so, so this is the system that we have. Okay. Now, now, so, 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 um, so this, was, uh, this was a model, again, that was introduced in the, in the 60s by Tosses and Hoffman. Uh, this, this, this model, uh, the, this pump leak model, has been uh, modified by many people, especially uh, those who work on uh, water transport and solid transport in epithelial systems. So, so like uh, the kidney, the, the intestines, and so on, where we have water and salt absorption. Okay, so, so, uh, so, so, uh, so, so these models are cell volume control models. So, so you're interested in homeostasis. So, so. Um, so uh, uh, in somehow trying to set, trying to keep the volume fixed at a certain volume, I, I would say. So, so, uh, so one interesting mathematical question you might ask is whether, whether there is a steady state to these things, to this, this system of equations, and whether those steady states are actually stable or not. So, so that would be the question of, that would be the mathematical reformulation of asking a homeostasis question. So, so uh, what I would like to do for the next uh, few slides is to talk about some mathematical results on the, uh, the stability, the, the existence uh, and stability of, of steady states for, for, the, for this pump leak model. So, so what's, 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 what's interesting, and, and after all, it has to be the case, it's kind of natural, is that, uh, is that the pump leak model satisfies an energy identity, as it should. I mean, there's nothing really uh, going on here than, than, than water and ions going through the membrane through thermodynamic potentials. That, that's, that's all that's happening here. So there has to be some kind of thermodynamic structure. And it turns out that there is. So, so if, you, if you, you cook up this function, which, which uh, it, this is non-dimensionalized, all of you would, would here would recognize that this is basically a, um, a, uh, uh, an, an entropy expression right, for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the concentrations. And if you compute, this, if you compute the, uh, the time the, uh, the time derivative of this entropy expression, uh, here, here, you know, we, we, so this is, you can, entropy, or rather, it's minus entropy, so, so minus, minus, sorry, minus absolute temperature times entropy, so, so it's more or less uh, a free energy, but there, there really is no e internal energy term here, okay, so, so, so it's U minus T S U is zero, so that, this is what our, our, our G is here. So, so if you set DG DT, uh, you, you say, see that dgt dt is equal to mu k, which is the, the chemical potential difference for each ion, times the flux, the osmotic pressure difference across the cell membrane, times the water flux. So you, 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 you obtain this, uh, this, this very natural and uh, uh, identity that we, all we, we, we see in, uh, in any book on 
uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, I would say. Okay, so so uh, so so the, the JK here are the passive passive fluxes, and the PK are the active fluxes, and so so this identity actually uh, gives us some structure conditions on what JK and JW have to be. So if uh, if we don't have any pump currents, that is, if we don't have any energy input into the system, the free energy should be decaying. Therefore. If pk is equal to zero, the sum of mu k j k and the sum of pi w j uh, plus pi w j w has to be positive, or d g d t has to be negative overall if we believe in thermodynamics. So, um, <coughs> so we will require that j k and j w have to be dissipative in the sense that these conditions have to hold. So, so in the in the in the um, in the in the general case, right? In, in the in the sim sorry, in the simplified case uh, here. Here, uh, th this is just linear in mu k, so it obviously satisfies those identities, uh, the, those, those structure conditions. Uh, in general, uh, in order for, for th this thing to be dissipative, you need these conditions to be satisfied. Okay, so, uh, so, so now, now let, let's, uh, so, so it, it's a little bit difficult to make any headway with these, those, those like general models. So I'm going to uh, simplify to a very simple linear model where the where the currents are just proportional to the difference in, in, the, uh, in the chemical potentials. And in this case, so this, is, this, is, this includes the first model that I talked about with just three ions. So in this case, it turns out that, uh, it turns out that one can prove uh, that, uh, that, uh, that there's just one, one quantity that you have to compute. And if this quantity is negative, then there's a unique steady state and it's globally asymptotically stable. And if m is greater than or equal to zero, the self bursts. So, so, so the so so the the, the story is that um, uh, so uh, so there is some interesting things about what this quantity really means, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. If you're interested, please ask me later on. But the uh, but the I, I think the maybe the interesting thing is how to prove that these steady states, when they exist, are are globally asymptotically stable. And 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 the way it works is the, the following. So so uh, so as is. As is the case, as is often the case with when you try to prove global asymptotic stability, you want to cook up a Lyapunov function. But now, but now, okay, so, so, so you might imagine that a good candidate for this Lyapunov function might be the energy, might be the free energy, because the free energy uh, was this guy. But the problem is that the free energy, right, only is a monotonically decreasing thing when pk is equal to zero. When pk is not equal to zero, which is which is what we're interested in, uh, or else you know you can't really uh, the cell will burst unless you put in some energy. The cell is not able to con uh, uh, control its volume. So so uh, so, but when pk is not equal to zero, right, it is not possible to use g itself as a Lyapunov function. But it turns out that you can you can basically uh, define another Lyapunov function, which is basically a renormalized version of this energy function, I, in some sense, you're, you, you, what, this, what this function g hat is doing, it is measuring the free energy with respect to the steady state. And so, so that, that mathematical construct actually has, uh, has this uh, mon monotonicity property so that you can use that to show that, uh, that this state is globally asymptotically stable. So in some sense, so, so, so what the pumps are doing is that it is shifting the energy, free energy landscape so that the steady state is stable. So this is c kind of the, the, the mathematical picture that emerges from this. Now, now uh, so, so what, can, can we say anything? So, so that was when we have these linear current voltage relationships. Can we say anything if we have uh, more general, uh, um, uh, more general um, current voltage relationships that are not necessarily linear? So this, this is the more more general case, for example, when the current voltage relationship looks looks like Goldman Goldman Hodgkin cat, uh, Gold, so the Goldman, if if we use the Goldman current relationship, which which has this uh, exponential and things like this that that uh, that appeared, at, for example, in Jurgen's model, can can we say anything in in those cases, for example? Uh, in that case, uh, it's a little bit difficult to say anything, but uh, there is a asymptotic limit in which you can actually say something, which is when the, which is what happens when the uh, pump strength is small. So, so that is when the pump strengths are small relative to, relative to um, essentially when the pump strengths are small relative to the currents that might happen, the, the currents that, the fluxes that flow through 
when the voltage is on the order of about, uh, on the order of the thermal voltage. Okay. So so this is this is uh, this is not this is probably uh, a realistic assumption in, at least in 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 uh, a big majority of cases. So in this case, you can actually also show that there at least exists an asymptotically stable steady state, and uh, if the pump leak uh, uh, strength is small, and, and the and the and the proof goes like this. So, so the proof is is that okay? So 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 let's say we turn off the pumps. Okay, if we turn off the pumps, the uh, the cell dies, the cell explodes, okay? and so the dead state is stable. Okay, because because, because you know it it's, it exploded and it's stable. So so dead state is city stable. Yes. <laughs> yes. Infinity, that's right, that's right. You don't have any mechanics that's right. Here we don't I don't have any mechanics here. That's right. If yeah, if I put in mechanics, it's actually easier. It's it's you can actually always control volume. It, it depends it depends on the growth, but yeah. Yeah. So so okay, so so in any case, what, what's happening is that let's say I, I turn off the pumps, then then the dead state is stable. Okay. So so then then you say, well, okay, so the dead state is stable when then the pump is zero. So if I turn on the pump a little bit, maybe I will be able to at least, at least uh, get a finite volume, right? And then, because the dead state was stable, the, s the, the state in which I, I turn on the pump a little bit and the, uh, the volume is finite now is also stable because the dead state was stable. Does that make sense? So, so that, that's the proof. Okay. So, 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 so basically, so, so, so the proof is that the, the proof is that the, dead, the, the stability of the dead state gives you stability of the live state. That, that's the proof. Yes? Why do you say that the V equals infinity is stable and that V equals zero? Ah, V equals zero is stable. In infinity is stable in the sense that uh, if you turn off the pumps, the, 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 the cell explodes. Why doesn't it shrink? I mean, do uh, because, uh, because, oh, because, the, because inside the cell you have solutes. You have impermeable solutes inside the cell, but outside the cell you don't. So, so if I don't have any pumps, water is going to continue to seep in, and, it, and the cell will just explode. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. So, what's the mechanical forces that um, yes uh, that, that, that would stabilize the cell? So, I mean, so yeah. So, so, so in yeah. So in reality, I think uh, um, yeah. Th that's a good question. You know, uh, in reality, I think uh, the uh, the 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 cell membrane with the usual cell cortex and so on can withstand up to about 5 to 10 millimolar at the very least of, of, uh, of concentration. So I think, I think uh, I, so, so I mean here, another, another limitation here is that here, you know, I, this is just a math problem. So, so I'm, I'm saying that, you know, uh, the cell bursts, the, the volume goes to infinity. Of course that's not true. I mean, at a finite point it's just going to burst. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just yeah. wondering. Um, yes. Whether the mechanical forces, how much would they stand? I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so basically, they would withstand up to differences in five to ten millimolar, milliosmo, so millimolar concentration differences in osmotic pressure. D d does that? Okay. And and this is for over all cell types. No, 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 no. This is for this is for. I think I actually don't know. I think average cell type is about that. So the one thing that the one thing that we know the one thing that we know is the tension at which the the, the membrane bursts. Uh, to to uh, relate this to a concentration, you need to know the cell size because then you're talking about a Laplace pressure, which involves yeah, curvature. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, the cytoskeleton is typically permeable, so the osmotic pressure difference is actually applied only on the membrane. Yes, the yes, that's right. That's but what, right yeah. but the cytoskeleton can do is to create attachment point that can change the local curvature. Mm -hmm. So it's not an easy answer and it certainly is not universal either. Have ever somebody tried to do some calculation for this? Sure, so yeah. You, are, you have a cortex, uh, you, proteins. Uh, but what, what answer protein do you want? Do you want a number as an answer? or well, Because this yeah. doesn't exist, you cannot well, have I that answer. Whether, um, well, it's, I think it's a very interesting problem. I was just wondering whether the mechanics would not is it clear that it's not, it's not sufficient? Well, uh, first of all, as, uh, as the cell volume increases, the, cu the curvature decreases, so the Laplace pressure actually goes down. So this is, can only stabilize if you put some sort of elastic element, which yeah, could be yeah, provided yeah. by the cytoskeleton yeah, yeah. or by the membrane, yeah. but this is unclear, and the membrane is fairly weak in general. Right, yeah. We can talk more in yeah. more detail. If you want. 
you'd like to know the numbers actually. Yeah. Uh, Right. The only so, number I can give you is the tension at which the membrane ruptured. This okay. Okay. Uh, so, so, yeah, in, in closing, I just wanted to point out that, uh, that the, the thing that I'm using here is the implicit function theorem. And the implicit function theorem is called Dini's theorem in, in Italy. And this room is uh, the Dini room, by the way. So, so I just, just wanted to say that. Okay. <laughs> not, not very important. But. Um, so, so, um, so, in any case, um, so, so that, that's, that's, the, that's the proof. So, so the. Um, so, so the, 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 the story, the, the interesting kind of, okay, so, so there was this uh, verbal, the verbal, uh, you know, description of how cell volume is controlled using these, uh, uh, using this uh, uh, two equations and two unknowns business and so on and so forth, and some hand waving, and, and et cetera. Uh, so so the, the picture that emerges with this analysis is that, um, is that the, the cell is somehow uh, shifting or playing uh, is controlling the thermodynamic landscape, so to speak, so that, and so that, uh, so that you can control cell volume, and it is somehow using the intrinsic kind of stability properties of thermodynamic functional to be able to get stable volume. So, so this this is the kind of the picture that emerges from from, from this kind of analysis. Uh, okay. Anyway, so so uh, this is not the end of the story, and, and I I mean at all, in fact, and. Uh, and I haven't done anything here, but I just wanted to point out that this is an interesting area. Uh, it, uh, so in the following sense, uh, so, so, so it turns out that the membrane potential is more negative for differentiated cells than, 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 uh, than, than, than undifferentiated cells, and people don't know why. So, so, so the, the fertilized egg has a, has a much lower, uh, I mean, a membrane potential that is much closer to zero than, than, uh, than differentiated cells like neurons and skeletal muscle cells and so on. And, uh, and tumor cells, which we, we typically think of as differentiated cells becoming undifferentiated, so they, be, so, they, so, they, so they acquire proliferative potential, they actually have uh, membrane potentials that are higher than, than differentiated cells. And we don't really know wh wh why, why this is the case. Again, you know, differentiation, division, and so on is, is something that is probably related to cell volume control. This, we, we don't have any idea why. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. What is the yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, I'm not I, I uh, I'm not expert enough to say anything about that. But uh, but well, usually uh, differentiated cells don't really divide. They they've lost their they've lost their division potential, and they're in a quiescent state where they just are there. I would say, yeah. So 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 I mean, um, uh, yeah. So, so so beyond that is is out of my uh, uh, expertise completely. Uh, another, another, uh, another thing that is uh, also known uh, but has never been explained is that the member potential changes with the cell cycle. So, so, uh, so, so, so it's actually the member potential is actually negative during the DNA synthesis phase and it depolarizes during cell division phase and again the reason why or whether this is just an epiphenomenon or whether it's, whether it's fundamental is, is unknown. Uh, sorry, can I ask a, yes. ask a simple question on, yes. on uh, yes. the yes. value of the uh, resting membrane potential yes. in yes. cells? In, in some non-neural non cells, this is yes. uh, set quite close to the Donnan equilibrium. Yes, right? yes. Where uh, yes. No, for, for the product of sodium, yes. uh, for uh, potassium and, uh -huh. and chloride uh -huh. concentrations. Sure, sure. Uh -huh. And uh, is this kind of, uh, you know, uh, constraint for the concentration of ions conducive to the stability from the osmotic point of view or not? Because this yeah. would minimize energy of yeah, ion yeah, transport, yeah. but uh, the, yeah, that's what a, that's does it do a, yeah, yeah, that's in, your, a, in your okay, sense? That's a, that's a, yeah. so, um, so, yes. So, um, okay. One thing I can say is that, uh, is that okay, so, so if we go back to uh, this, uh, this, um, this, this quantity here. So I say when m is very small, when m, m is small, then you have a unique steady state and so on. In fact, having a very, very high potassium concentration inside and having, a, and having potassium channels on the membrane is, is at least in, in, in some sense, it is basically uh, like trying to make m as small as possible, at least in this, in this scenario. So, so in that sense, uh, this uh, making the donor, making the membrane potential very close to the donor potential of potassium makes it as stable as it can be okay. to some extent. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, but yeah, but this is within that theory. Uh, may, maybe in general, I, I don't know. Okay, so um, so so uh, okay. Now, now uh, we, in the next uh, 10, 15, I don't know minutes. Uh, uh, I, I I promise to finish quickly. I'm not entirely sure if I'm keeping my promise. Um, I, I want to talk uh, quickly about cell movement, and I'll just uh, I'll just shut up. So so um, okay so. So, uh, cell movement is powered by molecular motors, polymerization, depolymerization, of actin, and so on, and this is what everybody accepts, including myself, but then the question is whether this is a whole story. So, so, um, so, uh, so there are ion channels, water channels, ion transporters uh, on the cell membrane, and, uh, and it's known that, that if you somehow block them, uh, sometimes cell movement is impeded, and so on and so forth. So, so, uh, so we want to try to understand uh, whether what kind of effects these things might have on cell movement, and and what we've done so far is actually quite very, very preliminary, which is to just build a de develop a mathematical framework that that may allow us to test these ideas. So, so, uh, so, so this was also motivated by uh, this uh, this very interesting uh, paper that, um, from from a group in Johns Hopkins. Uh, 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 with, with whom I, uh, I, I'm collaborating now. And, uh, and so, so, so what they did was uh, they have a cancer cell line and they confine it to a 1D environment and, uh, and, and, and these cells kind of, these, these, these cancer cells move like, like so. Uh, and uh, uh, at, you know, at, at speeds of like 20 microns per hour, this is quite, quite slow, but anyway. Uh, so, and then what they do is they, um, they uh, basically abolish their, their, their actomyosin system and microtubule systems, and they still move. So, so, so the, and, and, then, and, then the, and then this movement is also inhibited by uh, sodium hydrogen, sodium proton antiporters, and also acroporin knockdown. So, so, so based on these observations, they, uh, they uh, propose that what's happening is what's called the, what they call the osmotic energy mechanism, which is that uh, the concentration, let's say, let's say you have a, I have a cell here, the concentration of, say, sodium chloride is high here and low here, and the sodium chloride concentration in the middle is, let's say, in the intermediate range. Then osmotic pressure will make, make it so that water would want to go from here to here to here because the concentration is higher here, but then, uh, but then, if water is moving down, uh, the cell will move up. So that, that's 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 the, their osmotic energy mechanism. Okay. So so that, that's what they proposed, and so uh, and so what we wanted to do was uh, was to say, is this does this really work? First of all, and and, uh, and then uh, we also wanted to know whether uh, uh, whether this kind of thing was relevant to higher dimension as well, uh, and in general. How, how this kind of thing uh, might be, whether this thing is even, even plausible or, or, or not. Okay, so uh, by the way, th this kind of thing is not entirely new to biology at all, uh, in fact. Uh, so epithelial water transport actually works like this. There, are, there, are, there is no such thing as water channels, oh, so water pumps. That, that's, that's, that's what people think. There are, there are no water pumps on the, on the membrane, that is molecular water pumps. And so if when your intestine wants to absorb water, what it does is that it increases the concentration of salt inside your body so that water is pulled in through osmotic pressure. And, uh, and this is exactly what your, your intestines are doing, for example, in, 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 pl in, in, uh, in absorbing water. A and what uh, this osmotic engine mechanism is saying is that, uh, is that well, uh, if, if, if water is pulled in, I can use that for to to make the cell move forward, and, and if you look at the uh, the numbers uh, in terms of the speed with which water flows in through absorption, and compare that with the speeds that uh, that the uh, the this um, this osmotic engine paper reports, they're actually quite comparable. So so it's not too uh, it's not uh, it is consistent uh, uh, in some sense with with uh, uh, with uh, with for example epithelial water transport. So, so we, we wanted to uh, do some, so, so uh, we want to do some math, I guess. And, and so, 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 uh, so we're going to write some equations. So uh, let me do, go, go through this very, very quickly. Uh, so we have our reaction diffusion equations, uh, sorry. So, so uh, uh, advection, diffusion, and, um, and, 
uh, drift equations. So this is Poisson Lorentz Planck, but with electron neutrality uh, because the by length is so small. And then, uh, and then we have to do water movement, so, so we have to do hydrodynamics. So, so we, have, uh, we have the Stokes equation here because uh, usually in the cell, uh, inertia is negligible. And, um, and the interesting thing about, about, uh, about uh, fluid dynamic com computations of this nature is that, uh, is that we, don't have the, we don't have the no slip condition at the membrane because if, if we have, okay, so, so in fluid dynamics, usually you, you impose no, flux bound, no, no slip boundary conditions at interfaces, but if you do that, then water is not going to flow through the cell because uh, uh, no slip condition means that the membrane or interface is going to move with the underlying fluid velocity. If it does that, then water is not going to go in. So, so, so you have to have uh, some slip velocity between the uh, fluid velocity and the speed with which the membrane is moving, and that is, so u minus del x del t, that is equal to the water flux JWN. Okay. And, and the rest of the boundary conditions are basically uh, kind of standard. Um, and um, and, uh, and uh, just to make sure that we are not doing anything crazy, uh, you can uh, show that the, uh, the, uh, the model that we just, I just wrote down satisfies uh, this energy identity, much like the pump leak model. So, so in some sense, the model that I just uh, wrote down is a genuine generalization or a PD generalization of the pump leak model in the sense that it is consistent even up to you know, things like uh, uh, free energy dissipation and so on. Okay, so, so, uh, so, so for now, we haven't been able to uh, uh, do the electric diffusion part. So, so um, I, what I'm going to be showing simulations of in a, in a few minutes, I hope, uh, is, is just when we have a solute that, is, uh, that doesn't carry any electric charge, okay? but still we have uh, osmotic pressure and so on. And, uh, and so we have the numerical scheme, and it's kind of, uh, if you're interested, you can ask me later, but, um, but let me just show you a few um, uh, computations, and that's going to be it. Okay, so let's see if I can actually okay there we are so yeah okay so let, let me explain what what's what's going on here so um, so this is so so what's going on here is that we have a cell and uh, and we have ionic pumps that are that is pumping what pumping solute into the into here and pumping solute out in this direction. Okay, so so we have solute pumps here and solute pumps here. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen is that the if we start from a uniform concentration state at the very beginning, concentration is going to fall here. Concentration is going to go up here. Concentration is going to fall here, and concentration is going to go up here. Right? And then if 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 that does if if this happens, then water is going to follow. The, so, so, so there's going to be an osmotic pressure difference here locally, so that water is going to go in and water is going to go out here. Okay? And the other thing is that we have confined this cell into a channel so that we have zero boundary conditions here and here. And what happens is, as water flow is created, this cell should move forward. Okay, so, so this is, this is uh, what's happening here. And, uh, and so... Uh, this is the this this is the concentration profile uh, that we have uh, from this uh, simple simulation with kind of arbitrary units here, uh, and um, and and you can we can also and so this is this okay let's see so this is the velocity profile so so this is the uh, the uh, the fluid velocity profile that we get out of out of a simulation like this what, what's ha what's happening here is that uh, at Time ten, we're we're flipping the direction of the pump so that it moves in the other direction. Okay, so so that's that. So so um so this is basically these simulations are more or less just proof of principle. But uh, and uh, and I had hoped that uh, that I could actually show you some interesting, more or less more realistic simulations by the time of this uh, workshop, but I failed. Uh, uh, but but uh, I can tell you some of the preliminary things that are, that, I, that we found. Uh, uh, this is in collaboration with uh, Sean Sun at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. 
So, so we've been, been able to uh, kind of uh, extend this, this, this PD model that, that I just described to also incorporate actin polymerization based uh, cell movement so that we can, we can try to start to understand the interplay between, yes? Yeah, sure. The interplay between, between uh, actin polymerization and osmosis driven cell movement. And what, what turns out to be the case is that uh, actin driven cell movement is much faster and more efficient. Okay, that's uh, okay. Uh, but, but, but it turns out that if the external environment is very high friction, so, 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 um, so maybe there is lots of, uh, lots of uh, extracellular matrix proteins or whatever, whatnot, then it turns out that the osmosis driven mechanism actually works, works better much better. And, and, and it's kind of, may, maybe it's also not too surprising. Uh, um, the, uh, so the osmotic engine mechanism basically kind of uh, can't, only works when the, when the external friction environment is very high. When, when that happens, then it's actually easier for water to pass through the cell and let, make the cell move forward rather than the cell itself to actually move forward. Yeah. Uh, yes. 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 The fact that you have two boundaries? Yes. Which one? You mean? The top and the Ah, not really. I don't think so. I don't think so. No, this is just, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so the computations were, were done by my former postdoc, who's now at Case Western, and Shan Sun and Yi Teng Li, uh, who, Shan Sun and Yi Teng Li, who are at Johns Hopkins, have been, uh, uh, and I, and, Lingxing and myself have been collaborating on this project to try to uh, do something more interesting and realistic. And, uh, and there are a few other uh, stuff in electrophysiology that I do that uh, might be of interest to some people. Uh, please ask me if you're interested. Okay, thank you very much. I didn't understand why uh, in an in an actin rich or in a viscous environment outside the, the the osmosis driven movement is more efficient than actin. Stuff. Yeah, so so this we don't really understand yet actually, but uh, but um, but okay. So so one thing you, we can say is that we, yeah we don't know, but uh, so so if we if we don't have any friction and let's say we have this kind of thing, right? The only thing that this will do, I think, is that the this May, maybe not, but I'm not so sure. The, this, this cell might actually not move very much and just generate a flow field and that's it. You actually, so, so in order for this to allow the cell to move forward, the, the, the fluid flow actually has to have some kind of, has, there has, the fluid flow itself has to have some traction outside. And that's why you need, for example, zero boundary conditions here and here so that the fluid velocity here is zero and zero, so, so that you can actually move forward. Now, this kind of mechanism becomes, as you, as you can see, m more and more efficient as the outside medium becomes more and more viscous. Then you have more, the, the fluid flow has more traction, so you can actually move fat forward, uh, move uh, forward more efficiently, in fact. Yes? momentum balance is... Ah, okay. Yes. Can you, can you uh, the momentum balance. Oh. No, no, no. Uh, so, so um, yeah. So, so, um, so, yeah. So, so what happens is that the uh, basically what happens in this case, I think, is that the flow will be the flow that is created will look like this. But then, if it's just that flow without any kind of boundary conditions, the 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 cell might just be stationary and just the flow. There might just be flow. However, if you put this cell inside a channel and so you impose zero boundary conditions here and here, then, uh, then, then you, the, the cell would move forward bec just because I've imposed these zero boundary conditions here. You still have a problem of momentum conservation even if the cell doesn't move. You're still moving fluid. That's right, that's right, yeah. In, in, the, in, in, that, yeah, in that case, uh, so yeah, so, so, Be so then Because I understood then the that, the, that the fluid is moving because of the osmosis, right? Yeah, right, that's right, that's right, yeah. That's yeah right. So you're generating movement of the fluid? Yes. And ah, well, okay, so, so I, think, I think it actually works out. Let me, um, I'm, so, yeah, so, so I wish I could, I could explain more in like uh, physical terms, but I, I don't think uh, I don't think there's any problem with um, with force balance. I mean, overall momentum balance. But that's a good question. Um, 
I think what would, what would probably happen is that, hmm, so, so flow would, th there will probably be a recirculation here, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know. What's your, what's your boundary conditions on either side? On oh, on either side. Yeah, here, here and here, right? Here and here, yeah, this is periodic. It's periodic here and here. More question? Yeah. Uh, one question is about mechanics. Yeah. Uh, are you considering to take that into account? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, they, I didn't say anything, but yes, membrane mechanics is in there, yes. Uh, I mean, the mechanics inside the cell. Ah, the mechanics inside the cell, we haven't, I mean, in the, in the model I just showed you, we didn't have yes, anything. Yes, yeah. but, uh, but yes, uh, we do have actually an extended model that we do, which has some, some mechanics inside the cell. But it's very, very simple, very simple mechanics. Uh, the, uh, also, this could be a 3D uh, model. Oh, yeah, you could uh, do that. Yeah, you could do this in 3D, can, of course, yes. yes. Of, of, yeah, one can, well, could do that in, this in 3D, yes. Yeah. But I mean, we, we, I mean okay. we're not good enough, but so, yeah, no, so yeah. yeah. But it would, yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Okay, that's all. Okay, thank, thank you okay, very much. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Just, David, just short question. What about tomorrow? At 9 or 9.30? 9, no? We have, uh, how many talks? Three, three talks.